Hey, welcome to our Education Committee meeting. Are we ready? We've got a full um, presentations and exciting updates and information. So um, we're going to excuse Assistant Superintendent Starsecki, and we're going to go right to our presentations. So this is the Continuous Improvement Team, and we've got Denfeld and Piedmont. So that's exciting. So come on up. What can we do to help you out? Turn the TV on or... Ah, well, welcome to the group. Because <laughs> we don't know either. Yep. Yep. And if we can move the, this TV up a bit, too, so that the mic picks you up. It's important for you to be on the mic because it's recorded. Like, like, be, like up closer so that they could actually stand by the table and the mic would be right there. I noticed that the, this the last time we were together. That if this TV can. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to welcome Duluth Denfeld to our um, committee meeting today, and I'll let them introduce themselves, even though I would love to do that, but um, it would take a long time because I would want to add a lot. Like Member Lowvald said, don't forget to use your mics because we do record these and we need the audio. So all mics or? There you go. All right. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to be here. My name is Tanya Sconyers, just for the record, uh, principal at Denfeld High School. <laughs> I'm Marcia Nelson, assistant principal at Denfeld. I'm Allison Wood, a science teacher at Denfeld and on the CIT team. Uh, Brian Youngman, English teacher at Denfeld and a member of the CIT team. And Jim Erickson, assistant principal, also a member of the CIT team. <laughs> uh, we have other members of the CIT team that are not here today. So just to let you know who they are, um, Jessica DeMar, special education teacher, Ethan Fisher, a social studies teacher, Diane Fitzgerald, a counselor, Ed Lewis, math teacher, and um, we will be having another person joining us soon that is our... Um, Full service community school, school coordinator. Yes, that's right. At this point, it's Kathy Bogan, and uh, we are hiring okay. um, for another coordinator. So they, they have joined us. All right. You know, we're not, we're not usually a nervous group, so we're just gonna we're just gonna flow with it. But it's been a, it's been a day. All right. We have something called clearing at Denfeld, so I'm just clearing that it's been a day. All right. But we're happy to be sitting here in front of you because what we understand is this is about giving a summary and an overview of how things are going at Denfeld High School, um, where where we've been, where we are now, and where we want to be in the future. Is that correct? Awesome. All right. Well, I'm gonna get going, and I'm just what well, we actually. Mr. Youngman is going to get going because we'd like to talk about what's going right and what are our celebrations. So some celebrations at Denfeld in terms of academics, we've instituted the ninth grade bar team, which allows us to closely monitor every single freshman in the building. Um, we have, uh, we've noticed some reading intervention growth. Um, we've instituted college preparatory mathematics course. We have check and connect. Um, we have a 10th grade bar model, which isn't, um, it's the, uh, it's kind of like a PLC that the 10th grade teachers got together to um, monitor and watch our sophomores as well. And then we have the SOAR Academy that, um, in order to help with our, some of our more challenging clientele. Some other non-academic things that we wanted to bring to light. Uh, really just feeling like our staff is so good at connecting with students. Lots of conversations outside of the classroom. Kids eating lunch in people's rooms. I and mean, just lots and lots and lots of good relationship building is going on. Um, the full service community school has now, it's in the second week of DASH, is that right? Second week, our after school program. And um, the numbers are rolling in more and more every day. Um, of course, one of the big hitches 
is trying to get parents to know their kids there. But the really exciting thing is that there are bus passes and a super snack involved, which both of those things are even just getting some kids that maybe are hesitant to stay a little bit more interested in staying um, with the food and the bus passes. And so numbers have been increasing, trying to get teachers involved in being there with the kids so that they can get a little more connecting. So that that's growing and hopefully will grow even more. Lots and lots of push to get college applications put in, scholarship applications, staff asking lots of good work going in by the counselors and uh, the community service part of what's going on. We had great, well, the blood drives are going ongoing, the toy drive at Christmas, and then also we've been starting in the on Fridays, handing out packages of food for the kids who, at the end of the day on Fridays to take home for the weekend. And I think it was 40-some mm -hmm. bags got handed out this last Friday. Um, kids have been asking for that and very shy about it, so it's been great. We already do have our f um, food and clothing available during the week, um, but this was for the weekend to make sure that they could make it through the weekend. <clears throat> uh, lots of kids going to state for uh, fine arts and for athletics and other activities, music listening, all these other activities are happening, so we're excited about those kids. Um, for next year, the music department got a grant for a hip hop music class, so we're encouraging that for registration, and um, that will be a new interesting thing. They've been having a newbie band for people who have never been part of a band before, and they had some kids registering, so they're pushing that to say it's not never too late to add yourself in. Um, there is also the CRC is a conflict resolution program for doing mediation with kids. That's going, we've had some starting and more will be going on with that. And then, of course, Lots of students are accessing mental health professionals, and rather than having to drive and leave the building for their appointments, they get to stay in the building working with Nystrom and Fond du Lac. And Fond du Lac, yeah. So that's been really great that they don't have to leave the building to go to their mental health appointments. All right. This gets us to the portion of the uh, the data piece and in, in terms of where we got our information and in what steps that we wanted to take um, so looking at our compre or um, uh, putting together our comprehensive needs assessment looking at our MCA data and our PLC data um, and incorporating um, some new things in terms of our full service community school our staff um, getting input from student parent surveys um, the surveys that we did uh, we did during our 15-16 school year, uh, but then we also did to get ready to prepare, to prepare for the full service community schools to do focus groups um, so that we could uh, get that information not only from students but parents and staff to make sure that um, we could address the needs or just knowing what those needs are. Um, so that gets us off to uh, at least the portion of our data. Um, in terms of the uh, our school goals, um, we had by spring that we were going to be over our overall reading proficiency would be increasing by uh, from 51.4 percent to 59 percent. Uh, we did not meet that goal, um, but I would share that the the biggest celebration um, with that is the fact that we did increase by 7.4 percent, um, and so we started at 51 percent. Um, we made an increase of 7.4%, and so we're going to take that as a celebration. It, that, yes, we were shooting for 59%. We were at 588 So we are, we are thrilled with the progress. And then by spring of 2017, the overall math proficiency to increase from 29.4% to 35%, um, it actually it decreased by 0.5%, and so we did not meet that goal. All right. Um, but really quickly, for the non-academic data review, we just did the 16-17 uh, school year, and it mirrors uh, this year, um, where I, I can see we put them in numbers as opposed to percents, but um, roughly uh, just under 1,000 students um, with, if we put them in percents, given that we're using 1,000, we have 5.3% um, uh, American Indian population, 1.2% Asian, 3% um, Hispanic, uh, almost 9% um, uh, black students, white students, 72%, uh, and as a whole, about 9% more than one race. Um, 
very small percent as far as uh, English language learners, but we do have a program um, there and have a teacher on site um, for our English uh, language learners. We have about 25% population of sped ed students um, who receive special services and at this point about 60 <clears throat> excuse me about 68 percent of free and reduced uh, lunch students um, if you look at that that was non-academic if you look at the academic um, data uh, this is proficiency for reading it, it spans a four-year period where we've seen some, some hot some lows and then um, steadily increasing. We did have a dip slightly between the 14 and 15 and 15, 16 school year for reading for all students. Um, it went from 53.8 to 51.4, but again, our um, increase of this uh, past year to 58.8 percent, which which was a 7.4 percent increase. Um, we saw significant gains um, in uh, academic proficiency in reading with um, American Indian, went from 42.9 to 77.8. Um, I, I know you're aware of this, but I, I have to say it again, that the data that we're looking at is different populations of students. Um, you know, all of our 10th graders are tested in reading our 11th graders, so, you know, 10th graders of last year are now the 11th graders, so we're Again, it's it's what the state looks at, and it's what we we examine. But they are different populations of students. Uh, um, our students, um, our black students, went from 50, 15 percent proficiency to twenty point eight, um, and white students from fifty seven point five to sixty four point two. Um, our special education population saw one percent decrease in um, proficiency and free and reduced lunch saw an increase of approximately one one and a half percent if you look at um, math the academic growth for math uh, when we get to the area where we talk about where our focus is um, it clearly is math um, and reading but math specifically math we have um, proficiency rate of 28.9 that's down a uh, half a percent from last year and if you look across the board um, the the one gain that we did have was in special education about two percent and all other categories were um, they decreased um, from the year before this is last year's data. correct the 1670 17 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and given our population of students and we feel like one of the biggest barriers as we talk with teachers in the building is just that a lot of kids especially in math approach things and just feel overwhelmed and shut down and that the shutdown factor is way more important than just how are they doing on their score is if they actually feel like they can even attempt and that's I would say that's the one of the biggest challenges in my classroom too is when someone gets overwhelmed they're not even willing to try um, so one of the discussions, which I think was a, a brilliant change in our goal, is to um, be starting to look here now in this data, <clears throat> in the data review. Now, if you look, is about growth and um, reading growth instead of it being what their score was, was their growth score high or was their growth score low? And so we want to make sure that they're, we're looking at the idea of are you improving over time? And is the growth occurring or are you shutting down? <clears throat> is there anything else you want to add on the growth? Okay. And so in the world here, what we wanted to point out is that the idea of students who are not proficient in either of the categories, in reading or not proficient in math, are they growing? Are they in low growth? Are they in medium growth? Are they in high growth? What's their outlook on can I actually try? Am I learning new things every day? And so we're trying to get to the point where we have most of our students in medium and high growth. We want to make sure nobody's in their low growth mode. And we'll see more of that when we get to the, the school goals um, that we've set. But looking at this growth, and you don't have to do the math. We've done the math. But if you look at our reading um, goal, we had 78% of our students in medium to high growth, which is a celebration. It's awesome. We want the 22% to be in medium or high growth, but 78% of our students in reading were in medium to high growth. And maybe if I had Marsha's glasses. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, just a minute. <laughs> Sorry. People, I'll be 50 in three months. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's time to buy your own glasses. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. 
we had uh, we had about approximately 67 percent of our students um, in math and high to medium growth and we'd like medium to high growth and we'd like to see that that number increase also all right thanks for classes you're welcome it's a good friend. I'm here for you um, so I am just talking about a brief summary of our needs assessment and, and kind of identifying what we feel are our biggest successes and our biggest challenges. So um, again, we're talking about that the reading, the increase on the MCA tests, and I, I am really excited about that as a person who's a former English teacher and spent a lot of time with at-risk kids and teaching reading strategies and the belief that when you teach kids strategies to read better, they may not even realize it, but they get it and they do that. And that's what we did. We, we made a great effort last year with all of our staff to teach them how to teach reading in their classes. And the growth that we saw, I, I feel like it's um, directly related to those skills that they learned and we're hoping for for even bigger gains this year because it's really exciting to put forth that effort and then to see an immediate um, an immediate change in our students and it's you're never positive that that's you know that's the connection but that's that's the hope and that's what how we feel about it our bar program again for specifically for ninth graders building assets reducing risks they, they it's a very well thought out put together program and again very concerted effort to work with our ninth graders we feel like that's been um, very successful because after this first semester we've seen a decrease in failure in classes um, and number of disciplinary referrals for those students and an increase in attendance as well as contact and communication with the parents and guardians so kind of all over we know that when kids are successful in ninth grade they have a much greater chance of being successful in graduating from high school so we really feel like um, we're starting on the right foot with this class and we're anxious to see the progress throughout the next four years or three and a half years of high school um, our concerns are you know there's always things that you could pick that are what are you going to focus on that we need to do better and we know that um, the overall proficiency in math is um, below district and state with a slight decrease of 0.5% in the 16-17 school year. Again, those are different kids, but we do know for sure that we are going to work on math in a similar way that we've worked on reading this year um, as well and hope to see that gain. Um, and our student-specific groups, our African-American students and our special education students are significantly below district and state proficiency rates on MCA on the MCAs in reading and math. Um, so that will also be a concerted effort for us. Should I go first? Sure. So on to our school goals for 2017-2018. It's kind of word soup here, but we'll get through it. By spring 2018, we will increase the percentage of all students who fall within the medium to high growth range in reading from 78 to 83 to 88 percent. That's a 5 to 8 percent increase as measured by all accountability, accountability tests, MCA, uh, MTAS. So we're going to try and move the bar from, move more kids out of the low growth range into the medium and high growth range. So if you notice when we worded last year's school goals, not this year, it was about a proficiency rate. We are switching the language now to reflect growth. Who is actually working towards moving their, their improvements into the growth range? We want to be people in, in high and medium growth, not in low growth where they're stuck. So when you look at that growth chart, those are the numbers we're basing that off of. <coughs> The second one is by spring of 2018, we will increase the percentage of black students who fall within the medium to high growth range in reading from 57% to 64%. 64 to, 64 to 7, 67%, which is a 7 to 9% growth increase as measured by all accountability tests. And so, um, the, again, by spring 2018, we will increase the percentage of special education students who fall within the medium to high growth range in reading from 51 to 58, uh, 58 to 63. So we're looking for a 7 to 12 percent um, movement of the bar in the in the growth. 
And if you're wondering where those numbers came from, we're trying to get everybody up to a high enough growth. So in order to split up the goals over a number of years, that's the range that we need to get to to move everybody together. So some up to the 85 percent. So that's why the numbers for black students and special education students are different is because we are trying to split the difference over a tier of years of what the growth is that we want to see. And so our school action plan to achieve these, we have um, some initiatives, uh, reading and math interventions for target groups of students, um, PBIS, positive behaviors, interventions, and supports, um, BAR, building assets, reducing risks, check and connect, FC, FSCS, uh, full service community schools, SOAR Academy, and then some instructional practices that uh, we as a CIT team have kind of spearheaded across the uh, the staff here um, increased learning targets and then embedded formative assessments and we are now currently in the process of moving toward a peer review process and encouraging um, teachers to walk in and out of as many classrooms as they can to see who's who's doing what and hey I like that and mm -hmm. all that sort of good stuff but we're currently working on it. Um, so as we look at this, concerns that we're thinking about, because we think about we need to move forward and we need to make sure students understand what they're supposed to be doing um, and how to get the support that they need. One of the big things for the peer review process is it sounds like a great idea to have someone come in and talk about how you're doing and what they like, but that's scary. And I think a lot of high school teachers, I feel like elementary is somehow more open to that. A lot of high school teachers are really scared about that. <laughs> Why are you coming in my room? What are you watching me for? And um, So we're slowly starting that, and the CIT members are going to just go to their departments. And um, last week, this week, uh, just to pop in and kind of be there and see, do you have your learning target posted? Are you talking about something related to it? Just to get used to the presence of another adult in your room. And um, so that's going to be a tiered process to make sure it's not scary and it actually seems helpful to teachers. And then um, we really, it is, it is getting really confusing and challenging when kids do need interventions. We have some classes we can register for them. Um, to help them. Um, those classes still have really big sections, so how can you individualize a section of 20 kids, even though it's a smaller group than 34, 38, it still is a lot of kids. If you have students that are doing really poorly and you want to assign them to a win, which is a, one of our go-to methods, come in for win and get some extra help, the kids that really need to be there often don't come or don't show up. Um, and then still, if you have 20 kids and win, and you have four of them who have no idea what you're talking about, and 20 kids are there, how do you make that to be effective interventions? And so what are the best ways to access those kids? Is it a scheduling thing? Is it a extra thing? Is it a pull-out strategy? Do we need to look at separate interventionists that are not reading lab, are not math intervention, but just for small core groups of people. When you see the numbers of the discrepancy in some of our student groups that are not doing well, especially in math, how, I mean, when you can't, we've been talking with the special ed and some other teachers, you, if they don't even know the basics of orders of operation, what do you add and subtract and divide first, and the whole rest of the class is doing something different, maybe these four kids just need something. So. That's really our challenge right now, is how to really make our building feel like a problem-solving group and safe with peers, with peers going in to help each other out, and how to really be impactful with the interventions that we have available, or maybe think of new ideas for next year. Questions? <clears throat> I'm open. Thank you. I have a few. I'll try to keep them short. Um, I was really impressed with the bar. Um, I saw them do a presentation at um, the MSBA retreat. So, and one of the pieces that they talked about that was a challenge was staff engagement in that because it was different. How is that going for your teachers and educators out at Denfeld? Mr. Tuscan and I meet weekly, and is our, he's our bar coordinator. But what better person to share that, honestly? How's it going, Mr. T? Show up for one meeting and speak at another. Um, the buy-in from the staff related to bar is very good. In fact, they, if anything, they are very anxious to see better results. But at four and a half months, the implementation is, is full. 
um, and they're very bought in. In fact, if I would tell you one thing, that when we did bar the first time um, before the building closed, the staff that were part of bar before it closed are the ones that were very excited to hear that was coming back. And given that many educators over long careers become very cynical about educational change, that tells you everything you need to know about what bar means to the staff as far as what they're able to do for the kids. And we're already seeing some good results. And I have to say, the 10th grade staff, because we were not having very much success with some of our 10th graders, and we were a little jealous that the 9th graders got to have bar, and we didn't. <laughs> so um, we have now, on a, by every other week, the 10th grade staff are meeting in a bar-like situation um, to have the same kind of conversations. It can't be quite as impactful because we don't all share the same schedules, but we share a lot of the kids. And it, I mean, we were... We, we were frustrated to the point where there are teachers saying, like, I'm not sure what to do. I don't know if I can make it till Christmas break. It is just mm. really overwhelming. And having that group purely to vent, and then <laughs> where you've been in on all this, so pipe in. But it just, I mean, it really has the psychology part for it, the staff, and then the feeling that, hey, we can actually start to really track kids is huge, 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 huge. And so people gave up their morning time to join the... Um, tenth grade bar, not bar. The tenth grade peels. Bar bar yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was really struck at that presentation how they talked about the statistics around you can predict graduation rates by Halloween and night you're in your ninth grade year, and that's just chilling almost. So I'm glad that you guys are doing that. Um, my second question is around behavioral health services. The co-location piece is wonderful. Do you have an? Is there? Are all the needs being met, or do you need some additional mental? Well. <laughs> <laughs> that answers the question. <laughs> what do you see as some opportunities to maybe fill any potential gaps then that you might have? I, to be honest with you, I can't imagine how, what, how we could address all of the mental health needs. Um, we have two therapists from Nystrom and Associates, and they almost always have um, a waiting list and they're fabulous and kids feel really lucky to get to go see them so so what we have works so well um, but we really still have a great num a great number of kids who who need something and need someone and um, they're you know as the year moves on their waiting lists grow longer and I I don't know I don't have a good answer for what to do next with them but but the, just because the need is so great. And I think the need is great, and we provide um, for some of that need. Uh, the community provides uh, for that need also, where mental health needs are being met outside of school also. Um, I think that as we continue to see uh, what is generated within the community, for us to be open to partnering with um, you know, agencies or organizations and groups who can provide that mental health um, uh, support for our students. We had Nystrom and Associates for years only, and we have two full-time therapists, as Marcia was saying, but now we partner with Fond du Lac. Um, they've come in uh, with a therapist, and also, um, I, I don't know, I can't say the name. Is it Cambia now? Is it Woodland Hills? Is it I'm not sure, um, Rock Ridge Academy, but they um, also have uh, moved into the area with a mental health component um, very near Denfeld, as a matter of fact, right across the street. So we've been in conversations with them also. Also, what it really is about is keeping ourselves open as a school to partnering with um, the supports that are within the community that can continue to provide mental health services to, to our students. Again, we, we, we fill some of that need, um, but not all of it. I also wanted to add that I think I feel really, really excited about the full service community school and what that has to offer, not specifically even for mental health services through full service community school, but for the fact that, that students will have a safe place to go and food on their table and, and help, which may, helps them feel successful in school, which is the, the biggest part of their lives, whether they realize it or not right now. Um, and I'm, I'm just so excited about the fact that when they stay after after school and 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 Pambo has been amazing to open it up for any kid who stays after school for an academic purpose or for like basketball or or speech or you know that that she can figure out a way to get them fed so Huge. when kids stay they feel safe they have a purpose they feel successful and they get to eat 
it's just a win-win and that's really what a lot of our kids need and I think it's going to make a big difference in their mental health to have that kind of safety. I just wanted to make a really brief comment which is um, wanting everybody to understand and honor the fact that just focusing on the academic needs of the that students have, um, making progress in their core instructional program and then finding ways to intervene appropriately is all by itself a full-time job. Right? That is all by itself a gigantic role. And so when you hear about you know, Principal Sconyers talking about how do we partner with other agencies to help fulfill those needs because we know those needs need to be met before kids oftentimes really can focus in on their learning. Um, I think it's critical that we get the community engaged in helping with some of that work because we need our education professionals to really dive in on focusing on the academic needs that students bring to the table um, so that we can make that academic progress. And so I can't understate how important that community support is so that they can do the job they're hired to do, which is really focus on how we help students learn. So I'll just conclude. Um, I, re I watched those bags go off the table last Friday as I was setting up for the speech tournament, and, and that was really <clears throat> a, a great thing. It was done so um, complimentary to our, our student body, and, and uh, I think they felt comfortable right from the get-go, so I can only see that growing. So that was exciting and, and so um, warm-hearted. Um, I really love the um, focus on the growth mindset kind of mimics the book we all read as a staff and and just you know I think that the community might see the focus on testing like all this data that we have that you know and we want to get them up to 58 or 64 or whatever they might say oh my gosh that's we're not testers and we're not we shouldn't be focused on that but yet what I've come to know in my experience is that we are so blessed to have the data now to have the percentages to be able to monitor it when a kid sees a growth that just encourages them no matter what that growth or what that percentage is so we have to be sure that when we language talk about testing and because your parents will push back and they'll say my kid has test anxiety or why are we focused on the test and even I as a, a teacher 10 years ago was kind of a naysayer like this this isn't what we should be doing but yet one in the elementary they do it so well that by the time they get to high school in the next now our, our students now are used to that and so I just think that the data you can get and that I can focus in on the maybe my kid maybe my students are low in vocabulary maybe they're low in reading comprehension it just gives that teacher so much more specifics and interventions to do so I really um, love that you you settle on the growth mindset the bar I had experience with so it's just delightful to share with your colleagues and I can and the same thing happened when we did it the first time before the school closure is the 10th graders modeled because they they wanted that same kind of support team for their 10th graders and so um, and I also think that the bar and how the 10th graders and 9th graders are working as a staff is going to help that peer review if you're meeting in PLC's on a regular basis and building relationship if you are already working with cross-curriculum teachers that I don't think it's going we're not as isolated anymore and so I think that peer review even though it's going to be a little a little bit of a jump start is, is a great great thing so thanks for coming any questions superintendent thanks dr. Carey And now we get the delightful school Piedmont to come and share with us as well. So we're celebrating our Western community today.
Are we ready? We are. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Beth Shimon. I am principal at Piedmont Elementary. I'm in my third year with Piedmont. Um, I have. It's known as my home. I frequently ask Mr. Gronseth and Amy Starzecki not to move me. Um, we've developed a really nice community culture at Piedmont Elementary, something I'm very proud of. I'll let my guests introduce themselves. Okay. Um, my name is Michelle Blanchard. I'm an integration specialist at Piedmont. This is my first time being full-time somewhere. Um, previously, I was at two different schools, so it's been really nice being at one school. And I'm Kathy Akrovic, and I'm the reading interventionist at Piedmont this year. Um, I've been a classroom teacher in the past, so this is my first year doing intervention. Um, I'm also a member of the CIT team. I wish we were able to bring more people this evening, but we have parent-teacher conferences. So we have a, a house full at Piedmont this evening. So um, thanks for having us. As we get started tonight, um, I get pretty excited when I, I have the opportunity to talk about uh, PBIS at Piedmont Elementary. It's a positive behavior intervention and supports program that we implemented uh, the first year that I arrived at Piedmont. Uh, it's a framework that you'll hear frequently within our co school community, and we can pass um, some of the branding down so you can take a peek at it. Um, but it's a positive behavior intervention program for academics and behaviors. Um, also, cultural awareness, and it's really known as our way of life at Piedmont Elementary. Uh, this past year, we created a video that I did provide the link for you to take a look at. Um, I won't play it for you today. It's, it's quite amusing, but it does take a little bit of time, so I invite you to take a peek at it. Um, it's really changed the way we do business at Piedmont Elementary. The first year that we arrived, we determined that um, we needed to really look at the platform, the kind of the foundation of Piedmont Elementary. Um, it was in a little bit of disarray. We needed to develop, to develop some structures and systems. Um, so we met as a school community and we really talked about um, the data in the building. Um, behaviors were high. Um, needed some, some boosts in core instruction, and we just felt that the PBIS initiative was probably our number one priorities. So upon meeting with uh, Ms. Superintendent Gronseth and Assistant Superintendent Starzecki, um, I asked them to allow me to forego uh, a year of full academic, um, full academic um, goal setting and let me work on the structure of the system with the people in the building and, and rebuild some capacity and trust in the building. That being said, um, Panther Pride was really born and implemented school-wide. Is there anything you want to share on that? Um, so what we did, we changed over um, the fifth graders. They now have a um, student council and we have a school store. So what we did was, um, if you saw this little panther pride paw, it is now worth money. So the kids, um, we make sure they write their names on them, but it's a really good incentive for them um, to earn these uh, pride paws. And the kids that, the students that get them are really um, uh, really happy to get them. So, and what we're going to be starting also is um, I'm in charge of the morning announcements so um, I just all the classes get to sign up and I have a student come in from uh, it's been mostly third through fifth graders and um, after break we're going to be starting a panther shout out so it's another way um, to integrate our uh, PBIS for students so and I just have to add, um, the language that we have now is common language, so the, all the students understand, so we don't have to say so many words and people saying different things. And so that's been really powerful, I think, with our kids at Piedmont. And you go through a program that you train for three years, and Piedmont graduated this last year successfully. Um, the goal is to have 80% buy-in from your staff to, to do it with fidelity, and we're at the capacity of about 95% uh, school-wide with students, staff, and families at this time. So it's been a big success for us at Piedmont. We're pretty excited about it. 
Um, as we move forward uh, for year two, we really, uh, I was, uh, Piedmont was part of cohort one for the MTSS pilot program. We were with Lowell and Lester Park, um, and I always call Piedmont the caboose because I like to do things a little bit slower because I have to make sure I fully, fully understand. Um, so what we did is we really uh, spent a lot of time looking at our school-wide data for uh, Tier 1, which is core instruction, Tier 2 is our intervention model, and Tier 3 would be our special education services. And what we found is that we needed to really uh, focus on our core instruction and what that looks like in the classroom. Um, granted, we did have a curriculum changes past year. Um, we have new wonders uh, implementation, and we did have uh, three of our grades at Piedmont pilot uh, the wonders curriculum. We also uh, had to revamp our tier two, our intervention program. As you know, Piedmont has an inverted pyramid, which we are going to flip that baby around. Um, and so we had to look a little bit differently. The LLI uh, curriculum, intervention curriculum, is truly really meant for Tier 2 instruction. And the press intervention is uh, meant for Tier 3. And what we did after looking at our, our data is we determined that, that um, it was best that we implement uh, our press intervention model at Tier 2 and our LLI at Tier 3. Um, Kathy is our phenomenal interventionists within our building and we are just really thrilled with our recent winter benchmark assessments um, in implementing these new curriculums that we have to get literacy in the hands of our students and she can tell you a little bit about press that she works with. So in 2011 um, the Minnesota Center of Reading Research developed press with um, the University of Minnesota they partnered with Target actually which was interesting um, and they developed path to reading excellence it's, um, they piloted, in, in, piloted it in Minneapolis schools. So basically what it is, it's a framework and support for our MTSS. It's working very well that way. Um, it in, it's one main thing is it really includes quality core instruction. And it also, um, then of course, the tiered interventions. And it's based all on data-driven decision making, which is awesome, which is really good. And then it embeds professional learning. So I can go on my site and I can professional develop, professionally develop myself if I, just through the videos, which are very good. So that was kind of part of my training this year in addition to what the district offered um, since it's my first year. Um, but it really provides a nice framework for the students at all tiers. So what it begins with is we start by determining if there's going to be a need, a need for a class-wide intervention. Um, and then if that need appears, we do that for 10 days. And then we develop our, in, our groups, our intervention groups based on after the results of that. Um, when I go in to um, determine the groups, I start with our um, district screening, and we use that to determine who's going to be included in the intervention groups. And then from there, PRESS offers um, an initial intervention. Um, it's a little assessment that I give them so that I can target the specific intervention that I want to do with students. So it's a little bit different than LLI, for example, because I'm targeting um, one of the big five, so I might be, they might end up in phonemic awareness, and then I know I'm just going to work on that. And then I work through that until I can move to the next area. So it goes through that, and mainly because I'm K3, most of my interventions are phonemic awareness, phonics, and fluency. Now with third graders moving into um, fluency and comprehension. So that's what's different from PRESS to LLI. Um, so the groups are based on four to six students. Um, I progress monitor weekly. Um, one of the progress monitoring sessions with the students is based on the press, which is their targeted instructional level progress monitoring. And then the following week, I'll go in and I'll do the general outcome measures, and I'll just do the overall reading skills. So I'm going back and forth each week. So I have a lot of data, which is really helpful when we come to MTSS weekly. Um, it really shows us right where those kids are. And it is meant to directly just link exactly where the problem is. So it helps us with that. It's, and also, they told us at our press training that um, it, the research that they did had shown that these targeted interventions um, actually showed more growth in students versus just general guided reading group. So that was interesting research that they had behind that, too. So that's the gist of what I've been working on with the Tier 2 kids this year. 
And you, that, that is really reflected in our recent winter benchmark assessments. We saw some pretty phenomenal growth that we were really pleased with the results. And that was one of the reasons we made the decision to put press in our tier two and LLI into our tier three. We really needed to get um, leveled readers into the hands of some of our special education students so they could just be reading good fit books. As we move forward to um, the last area of our celebration, and that is the basic needs and support services, um, at Piedmont we're really, really passionate about the whole child. And one of the things that uh, ha has been glaring at Piedmont is uh, some of the basic needs are just not being met for some of our kiddos. Um, first year at Piedmont, uh, we just did some data review and we noticed a lot of our students that were being referred um, for special education um, interventions and evaluation uh, did not have, um, I noticed a lot of kids didn't have glasses. So we implemented, um, before we even started intervention work, we implemented a vision and hearing screening with our nursing department. And the data came back that 50% of our students had a vision or hearing impairment. So that has been a really powerful experience for us because we have got to take into consideration the needs of the whole student. Um, with that comes ther therapeutic services within the building, um, co-located services. We have uh, recently have the Northwoods Partnership. We have the day treatment program that's housed in our building, and we also have the outpatient uh, program where we have two uh, counselors come in and work with our students. Um, and we have got a really nice partnership with that team and um, have been very impressed with the services that they've provided with us and the work that they've done with our families. Um, we're really bridging that gap between home and school, which has, has been a real positive for us. Um, also, we I think we are possibly the only one with a general ed social worker in elementary school. I'm not for certain, but I think we may be the only one. Um, I'm a firm believer in having uh, general ed social workers in our building. We do also have a special education social worker. Um, she sees a caseload from anywhere from 55 to 64 students a week, um, and we have a waiting list at this time. Um, most recently, we had a large group of our students in the building um, have families be deployed, and we have a number of students that are in crisis with their families being overseas. So I just think that they, um, the general ed social workers and the special ed social workers play a key role in the mental health and the structure of our buildings, and I am a huge advocate for having more of those boots on the ground in all schools within our district. Um, as we move forward to our continuous improvement team, um, uh, Kathy's with us this evening, but the rest are servicing and working with our families tonight. Um, you'll see the list of our, our continuous improvement team members. A majority of them have been on the team for the last two years um, and will be fulfilling their third year this year. As we move forward to our data review, um, we have the 2016-2017 uh, school goals, and my um, data that I embedded is a little bit different, but one of the things that um, was a little bit glaring at Piedmont is the, the level of um, the achievement gap. Very significant. So what I, what I brought with from a former school is we implemented a growth model and instead of a proficiency model, um, students that were significantly below grade level really um, felt despair when they're looking at numbers of, prof of proficiency levels. So what we did with our, our fast benchmark assessments and our um, state accountability tests is we implemented a school-wide growth, growth model where we took all students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade and we um, evaluated all of their scores from the previous year and then we set up a target goal which was uh, anywhere from a three to five percentage point uh, growth. Um, we're pretty proud to say that uh, some of the students um, felt that those were attainable goals, so they worked really hard. Um, because when you take a student who is um, not meeting and ask a student to jump to proficiency or exceeds, that's a, that's a pretty big jump, and it feels a little bit defeating before you even start. So we implemented a 3 to 5% growth model um, for every student at Piedmont Elementary, and we had kids that um, took the tests, and they, they grew, some of them grew anywhere from 14 points to 29 points. This also included our special education students, so we had a really big celebration um, our first year uh, because of this success. And 
what was really great about it, the students felt success. And that is most important because um, it gives them hope that they're on the right track. And I think that's the way to closing the achievement gap with our kiddos. Anything else you guys want to? So when we talk about meeting or not meeting our goals for our reading um, state testing, we uh, our, our previous scores from the previous school year, 16-17, was a 15.2 proficiency rate um, to 53.2%. Uh, we did not meet that goal, though we did have an increase. We did celebrate that we um, did have an increase in that, but we did not make the 3%. Um, we did test out at 51.7%. Um, some of the barriers, I think, that contributed to that were we had three grades testing, uh, piloting wonders. We had some grade levels uh, working with Storytown. And um, it was a little bit of a challenge, which you'll see ahead, where we're <coughs> going to talk about attendance, which is a, a barrier for Piedmont. And we piloted journeys as well that year. So we had two piloting uh, curriculums going on. So that's another reason, I think, yep. that it might have affected it. So we had three different grade levels piloting. We had kindergarten, we had second, and we had fourth grade. As we move forward to our math goals, we had... Um, Proficiency rate of 48%. Um, goal was to uh, test out at 51% or above, and the, the students um, exceeded and met their goal with 51.5%. As we continue to move down, um, PBIS is a, is a goal that we implement every year, and that is to maintain our 80% buy-in and to introduce a new school-wide initiative uh, one of the initiatives that we implemented this year was um, homeschool communication um, in some of the feedback and surveys that we had from families as they wanted to have more information on how they could implement PBIS within the home. So they were speaking the same language um, that Piedmont was speaking. It's pretty cool. So um, that being said, we have about 95% buy-in at this time. Um, PBIS also offers a Swiss data program that provides data tracking on where we're seeing um, negative behaviors happening in the school, kind of red flags within the building. Um, it tracks our out-of-school suspension, um, the work that we're doing with our students, it, it might, might, might show information that says that the cafeteria is a real hot spot, so then we'd go back and reteach the expectations. Um, one of the things that we included in our PBIS model this year is we implemented a suspension forgiveness program. And uh, our, our dean of students, Jake Laurent, um, created this model with his behavior team. And um, recent data just ran for uh, the new suspension forgiveness model has showed has shown a 60% decrease in our suspensions for Piedmont from at this time for this time right now compared to last year at this time. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, as we move forward into the data review, non-academic. Um, we have all students um, for demographics, and then we have it broke down into our, our subgroups where you can see all the data listed there. Um, we seem to continue to have a steady um, increase in our student enrollment. Um, we do have a, a pretty steady a transient population coming and going, um, which is always a challenge um, <coughs> navigating where they are academically. Um, moving forward, we will go into the reading proficiency by student groups, and you can see our data tracked for the last four years, where you're looking at uh, 2013, 2014, through 2016, 2017. Um, there has been a, a steady increase in um, our student performance. I want to just backtrack real quick up to our data review. If you look under the column, the second column, met, not met, if you click into the link that I embedded into the PowerPoint, you're going to see our, um, our kickoff PowerPoint for the year, um, where data drives the decisions at our building. And we drill down to what is the purpose of why we do the work we do. If you go down to slide five and beyond, you're going to see Piedmont's performance for the last five years in comparison with the district and state um, proficiency rates. So that's something you could look at more, more closely. When we jump ahead to slide number seven on our Record of Continuous Improvement PowerPoint, um, 
it is broke down for reading and two areas that we look at um, some of the successes that we've had is in some of our subgroups we've seen some really positive growth um, white students, uh, students in our special education had a significant growth in their performance for the 16-17 year, as did the free and reduced lunch. Uh, two areas that you will see in uh, the slides ahead that we have really tacked down and, and are drilling down nicely is looking at some of the, the students of color and as to why we're seeing um, some of those, those scores go down, and I can talk a little bit about that as we move ahead. On to the next slide, slide eight, which is our math proficiency by student group. Um, we have made some nice gains in math overall. Um, that shows the last four years. Um, American Indian students have made some significant gains in uh, math testing, as have the um, white students and special education took a really nice jump in their performance this year too. So we're, we really attribute that to breaking down, um, drilling down our data and looking at what the real needs were within the building. And um, that being said, part of the special education success is we've created a new SPED model at Piedmont where we are more of a departmentalized model for our special education services and we are currently have a special education uh, reading teacher for K-1-2, uh, 3 four, five, and then we have a math special education teacher and then we have a teacher that is working on behaviors and social skills and that is called our pride room. So we're really able to, to target on that core instruction and working with uh, the skill sets um, and levels that the students need. In the sample, if you go to slide 10, you're going to look at the, um, the data um, embedded in the data review for academics, for reading growth and math growth. Um, this is a, a sample of the population. I believe there's about 140 students in this sample set. And um, if you really look at the data, especially in the medium high uh, proficiency and non-proficient areas, it, goes, it relates directly back to our growth mindset and setting students up for growth and working towards proficiency. As we move to slide 11, um, this is something we frequently talk about in our staff meetings. Um, we call it the three W's, what are our wins, what are our worries, and what are we going to do about it? Um, this directly relates to anything that's happening within Piedmont Elementary. Um, it doesn't have to be academically driven. It's what, what's best for um, the students who house our building and what's best for the school community. So these are three areas that we target frequently in um, our staff meetings and the work that we do as a continuous improvement team. So based on the data that, I've, that we've presented today, um, the wins that we see are the reading proficiency over the last four years overall has steadily increased in proficiency, towards proficiency. Um, the performance increase in subgroups are free and reduced, white and special education. Um, data from the from reading, the worries that we have, uh, performing below district and state proficiency, and performance decline in our subgroups of our American Indians and our African American students. Um, we continuously revisit this data and we ask ourselves, what are we going to do about it? Um, and before I go to the what's, I want to just move quickly forward through our wins and talk about the overall proficiency increase in our math test scores and um, performance increase in our American Indian white special education and free and reduced lunch. Um, again, some of the worries, we, could, we perform below district and state proficiency, and we have a decrease in our American, African American population. Um, we always go back to what are we going to do about it, what next? Um, so, and you're going to see in our future goals, what we did is we, um, we started pulling attendance. Um, we started looking at some of our attendance to see our students in their, in their seats for core instruction. Um, it was glaring in our data research um, that we have a number of students that are arriving. Um, common arrival time is about 10.13 each day. And um, I can tell you that is about 80% of one core instruction time. That is, that is happening in our classrooms. Um, you know, there's classes that are running specialists in the morning, but overall that's 80 to 85% of core instruction for one 
core math or core reading. So if our students are, in, are not in their seats, they are not getting the instruction they need. That is a glaring concern to us for us, and that is going to be our number one priority for next year. Anything? I feel like I'm doing all the talking. You have this. Okay. <laughs> so as we look at um, a summary of our continuous needs assessment, the goals, um, it's just a recap of what we did. We focused on our school community and culture, um, PBIS. We um, drilled down on our MTSS framework, uh, core instruction, interventions, and special education. We looked at some of the model um, service models that we provide in our building, and we adjusted those to best meet our students and the whole child. Um, focus continues to be on academics, behavior, and um, cultural needs of our students. And prioritized concerns include the, the subgroups of our student population and how we can support them to, um, on attendance and uh, core instruction. Um, as we move forward, that you will find in our school goals. Uh, this, for the 17-18 school year, we have devised a team to drill down that data to look at, at school-wide attendance and um, building the gap between home and school partnerships and, and, and educating families and staff on how we may also need to modify some of the um, instruction in our classrooms at different times of the day. We will continue to work on our balanced literacy framework and our practice profiles, and right now we are working on interactive read-alouds, and we are continuously doing fidelity checks um, to make sure that everybody's on the sp same page building-wide. Um, MTSS academic behavior is a priority for us, and we're looking forward to moving forward that into year for year four. Um, school action plan. Um, I've embedded the links on what our PLCs look like. We have a paw time at Piedmont Elementary, and what the teachers do is they meet um, as a school community with our uh, special education services, our behavior teams. Um, they take their common formative assessments, they take that data, and then what they do is they break up into um, paw time, Panthers at work, and one teacher takes an enrichment group, one takes teacher takes uh, a targeted intervention group and students that are significantly um, below uh, that assessment, um, they do a, a targeted intervention. That has happened primarily grades two through five. Piedmont is a 21 section school, so the specialist schedule has been a real barrier for us to get a common planning time where interventions and enrichment can happen school-wide. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big concern for us at Piedmont. Having a, a 21 section, so to get all second grade teachers to be able to offer a pie, a paw time across the board where they can they can cross share students. So one teacher could take an enrichment group, one teacher could do a targeted skill, and if they have to go back and reteach, um, what's happening is second grade, for fifth grade, they're random areas trying to piecemeal. It's a it's a big puzzle. Um, and that's been a real barrier when you have 20, 20 plus sections. And for the interventionist, um, it's really hard for me as well, just because sometimes it'll be their intervention time, but then we have the specialist time at the same time, like once a week. So that's been really difficult too. A quick question. <clears throat> I just want to make sure I'm interpreting the data correctly. So you said that one of your wins was um, around improved math proficiencies, but if I'm looking at grades four and five, nope, three, well, most of these, there's actually, a, well, except for three, there's a decrease. So are, are you using K through five data when you talk about wins, or am I just misreading? Nope, I'm, talk I'm talking primarily about two through five. Um, but what, you know, I'm glad that you asked that question. So if you go back to the, to slide um, nine, um, when you look at, we had two. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's a data review academic, and it says reading proficiency and math proficiency. One of the things we did last year is our fifth grade team uh, for reading and our third grade team for math. You're going to actually see those have a, a, a nice increase in their test scores. Um, they, 
solely ran their instruction about around state standards and benchmarks, and they use their curriculum the way it's supposed to be used as materials to support the benchmarks and the standards. So sometimes we get into the mindset um, as teachers, and Dr. Carey can talk a little bit about this too because I see you're getting all already. Um, <laughs> We think that we have to follow the pacing guide and that we have to teach every single thing that's in that unit. Some of those units include material that students are not testing on. And sometimes time is spent teaching a skill or a strategy, and it's not something that the student needs to know. That's not part of their third grade standard. So we had two grades. Um, uh, math, third grade, used the Mastery Connect. They piloted that in the building um, with Laura MacArthur. And their, um, their student outcomes were outstanding, and they, they solely ran their instruction based on the state standards. And that's also what our fifth grade team did. Um, they ran their instruction, and they used their curriculum as supplemental material. It was fantastic. comment I'll make and I'll keep it brief because I know we have a lot of um, presentations to get through yet tonight is that um, really sometimes it's a really simple formula and we try to make things more complicated than it needs to be. Um, if the test is testing what the state says we're supposed to teach, let's track and monitor student progress on what we're supposed to teach and the test will take care of itself. And when we've had um, groups of staff understand that and understand that really well and then be very serious about how they monitor student progress on those very specific things, we've seen good results. And part of that is putting the tools in place to make sure they have the resources they need to be able to do that tracking efficiently and effectively. And as school systems, that's something we haven't traditionally had. Um, it's a piece that we're trying to work on, doing the background work necessary to be able to move that direction. Um, but there's certainly some cost and support involved to get those systems in place. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say thank you for having me visit. Last week I went and I did a tour and I really enjoyed it and so I recommend everybody go do a tour. But I was very impressed at the atmosphere um, and the, um, the kids' literacy in terms of talking about sort of emotional intelligence. I think I heard kindness in uh, several different classrooms just as part of the book they were talking about and then part of a discussion. And um, that struck me. And you spoke about um, how the changes over the last few years outside of core curriculum have really benefited in terms of absolutely the results. And so uh, I just want to commend you on that and say please continue to serve the whole student because it's showing um, in terms of results and their success. I think that's, you know, that's a really, um, I appreciate, I really appreciated your visit and our doors are always open. Um, there's one thing I can tell you that the Piedmont staff is, they're an amazing group of people and um, I think when you create a culture um, where people feel safe and trusted, um, People, people can do their jobs. I, I am not a reading expert. Um, my job is to help create a, a, a culture where people can be at the best they can be in the, in the role that they play in a building. And I think that we've come together um, knowing that if, if we can do our jobs well, um, we need each other in order to do that. So um, that's really been a goal for us at Piedmont, and I, and I think it's worked well for us. Um, last but not least, I... I this is the first year we've had Michelle in our building full time. She's our integration specialist. And I cannot tell you um, the impact that has had with our students. Um, she has pushed in um, and worked directly with our students in the classroom. She does intervention and extension work with our students. Um, that is an in instrumental role um, that she has. And it, I wished I had two or three of her in our building. Um, the connection she's made with our children has, has been so powerful. Um, I, I just can't say enough about the work that she does, and I appreciate what the integration specialists do school-wide, and I would like to see more of that happening throughout the district. Thank you, Piedmont. That concludes our Piedmont presentation, and I echo everything that um, my fellow board members said, too, and appreciate your willingness to come down even on a I can't believe that you guys are here in its conferences because I know what that looks like in a building so <laughs> thank you thank you and we're going to switch now to true north
True North AmeriCorps and Key Zone partnerships. Well, good evening. good evening. Thanks for having us here. I'm Jay Ressler, and I'm the Director of Community Education for the District. And I'm happy to be here with some of our community partners that, uh, that focus on student success <clears throat> across the school day and into the after school programs. And uh, we're going to present briefly present some of the data sets that we look at that measure success in our programs. And I'll let, I'll let the team introduce themselves as we go down. So we'll start with Melissa. Great. Thanks for having us. I, my name is Melissa Fanning, and I'm the out-of-school time director with the Duluth YMCA. And I am um, a co-director with the Keyzone program. I'm Carrie Copperud, and I'm w with the district. I am the Keyzone director. My name is Chris Lund. I'm the program coordinator with True North AmeriCorps. And I'm Sarah Hendrickson. I am the interim director of True North AmeriCorps. Okay, okay we want, uh, Melissa is going to go through some of the data that you've received in your packet concerning our key zone partnership uh, with, uh, mm -hmm. with YMCA. And also last year was the uh, uh, fifth and final year of our uh, grant support that we had through the 21st Century Community Learning Center grant and she'll present some of those data sets as well. Great, so I think you all received this via email already. So the one that I'm going to go through first is the one that says the 2016-17 Key Zone results. Um, so just on the top there, it talks about all the kids that we served throughout the summer of 2016 and throughout the whole school year. Do you guys all have that? Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, and then below, we talk a little bit about um, some satisfaction surveys that we received. So what are parents thinking about our program? Are we helping them out academically? Are we connecting the school day to the after school um, program? And so 90, almost 90% says yes. Um, we have some volunteers in our program that are helping assist us as well, and that includes the True North AmeriCorps member um, that we're going to hear later. We have a lot of those that are also helping assist us after school um, with case load of students and helping them academically as well. Um, and then youth, we want to hear from the youth. What are they thinking? Do they want to be in program as well? And you know, they are making those friendships, they have friends there, and they want to be in program as well. Um, the other document that we have is specifically about 21st century, so you have that as well. Um, and so we were able to scholarship the 790 kids. This is through the grant, the 21st century grant. We also um, include other local funds and then kids that are on county assistance as well. So those are all the students um, from that large number that we had on the other sheet. And this is the kids that we targeted specifically with scholarships. Um, and so we then do pre-post surveys with our 21st century grant. Um, it's a survey for academic youth outcomes is what it's called and these are some of the results that we received from them so the one about the support of adult and about going to college and friendship all come through those academic um, surveys that we re that we um, did the pre and post with our students and then the one about academic performance is specifically from teachers so the teachers that are working with the students during the school day and then they're coming to us after school we do do a survey with teachers to gather their information and how they feel that we're helping support the kids as well and so those are just some of those re, um, results that I wanted to share with you. Um, so now we want to take a look at our partnership with uh, True North AmeriCorps. And they would like to present some of the data sets they look at 
and some of the impact of the grant uh, on the programs, both uh, during the school day, which you just heard two great presentations about the work being done during the school day, and then how that transfers into after-school programs, which we partner with uh, True North AmeriCorps as well. So, so Chris, you got yeah. it? All right. I must just say, Member Lofold, it's um, kind of uncomfortable to speak in front of a speech coach. So just, <laughs> I'm just hoping that you don't like give us a score afterwards or something. Um, yeah, so I'm the program coordinator with True North AmeriCorps, and um, we just wanted this evening to give you a stronger grasp uh, about what it is that True North AmeriCorps does in the schools, um, and then also just share and celebrate about the impact that we had this last year. Um, and ultimately, we are hoping that you'll continue to support our programming um, and that this 14-year-old uh, partnership will continue to um, exist in our schools. <clears throat> so let me just step back and start with AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps is um, symbolized by this. You've probably seen this somewhere, right? Um, AmeriCorps is a, a network of national service opportunities across the country. Um, and so Peace Corps is um, one of those, Senior Corps, Math Corps. Um, now, True North AmeriCorps is Duluth's own AmeriCorps program. So um, about 14 years ago, the YMCA, the city, uh, the school district um, partnered up to bring AmeriCorps resources to, uh, to Duluth. Um, we've always been a youth development and academic support program um, since that um, inception. And uh, yeah, just that partnership has had, a, over the 14 years, has had a big impact on, on kids in Duluth. Um, before I jump into exactly what it is that we do in the elementary schools in Duluth, I want to give you an idea of who it is that uh, our members are, our employees. We call them AmeriCorps members. Um, so we have 32 AmeriCorps members in Duluth right now serving uh, across the city. Uh, a majority of them are recent college graduates, um, most of them hoping to go into education, social work, a, a related field. Some of them are retired educators. Some of them are... Uh, just uh, citizens looking for a way to be involved and in, in to contribute to their um, community. Uh, our members do receive a, a small living stipend and an education award. Uh, it is, we are positive that they do not join AmeriCorps for the money. Um, uh, you can, yeah, Rosie Loeffler Kemp was actually a member. Uh, Loeffler Kemp was a, is an alumni of ours, so you can um, chat with her about that. It's, it's a, it's a passion for the community and, and enjoyment of kids that drives members to apply. Um, now, what exactly does a True North AmeriCorps member do? We are math and reading tutors in the elementary schools. So uh, we are focused on closing the achievement gap by providing indiv individualized remedial instruction to, to students. So our students are working in small groups or one-on-one -on -one uh, with students in math, kindergarten through third grade is, is where our members focus with math, or reading is fourth and fifth grade. Now in math, our members are focused on building fundamental number sense. They have tools to, to assess uh, exactly which skills students are missing um, and, and are able to target those skills. In reading, uh, we have obviously fourth and fifth grade, w our students have to have reading down by fourth and fifth grade. It's, that's, it's, a, it's a crucial, crucial time. Um, you can make all sorts of project, projections about outcomes uh, for students based on fourth and fifth grade reading. Um, so we catch them there, and we are focused specifically on reading fluency, um, the number one predictor for reading comprehension. If you don't have fluency, no way you have comprehension. So um, we are using, uh, in, in response to um, some requests to, to provide more structured interventions, um, there's not always the capacity at, this, at the school staff or, or teachers to, to supervise our members. We, in response, have equipped each of our members that do reading interventions with four Chromebooks, and, and they are doing Read Naturally Live, which is focused on the reading comprehension um, piece in, in the schools. Um, now, which students do we work with? Uh, we are um, able to identify, based on the fall benchmark scores, uh, students that are in a zone with moderate risk. Uh, you could call it the yellow zone, is, is what a lot of uh, staff call it. Um, so we work specifically with yellow zone students um, who are identified using those fall benchmark scores. And each of our members has 20 of those students on their caseload. And they're working with those students um, perhaps daily or three times a week, uh, fitting in with, with uh, core instruction ske uh, schedules. 
So uh, as a result of, of the caseload and the interventions, um, uh, just on the, under who we reach on your in infographic, we last year uh, executed 23,499 academic interventions um, with students across Duluth. So that's 23,000 times where a student who we know needs, uh, needs help in a certain area, and we know what area that is, they're sitting down with a, with a, with a human being and receiving uh, you know, individualized instruction. So we think that has a big impact. Um, I think we have the schools that we're at right now. Is that maybe the next one? Mm -hmm. So we are currently in eight schools, each of the elementary schools except for Lester Park. Um, we've been in Lester Park um, historically. Um, we have 12 members in the district right now. That is um, a low compared to where we've been in the past. We've had, had 19 members last year. Um, and I think up to 30 at, at certain points in the 14 year history of this partnership. And we would love to increase that number. We have so many applications from people who want to come and be um, AmeriCorps tutors with, with True North. So um, we would love to see that partnership kind of um, grow in that direction again. Um, yeah, so let's talk about outcomes there at the bottom of that front, front side. So uh, the first way that we measure outcomes is by comparing that, those fall benchmark scores. Um, where we identified the moderate risk level, that yellow zone, comparing that to where they're at in the spring based on those benchmark scores. And so looking at that, um, we uh, found last year that 234 students moved down a risk level. This is where you want students to move down, right, is in risk levels. So, so we had uh, 234 students reduce a risk level. Um, that's one in three of the students that we worked with in reading last year, and that's 40% of the students who received math support from us. Um, and and uh, granted, last year we worked with a, a much larger number of students. That's why if you're seeing, okay, uh, 260 students serviced this year, um, it's lower because our partnership is lower this year. Um, so um, I'm actually going to skip that last section on the, the front of that infographic, and I'm going it, to. It'll make more sense when we come back to it. Um, just want to look on the back side now, um, and and just examine for a second the impact our members have beyond the classroom. Um, so the classroom is a big part of what they do, but after the school bell rings, uh, school day ends, our members uh, are actually then serving in the after school program, the, the key zone partnership. Um, so they, each of our members spends about 10 hours a week in, an after, in, the, in the key zone after school program. They're there as academic support specialists. They're supervising homework time and, and doing tutoring in the after school program. They're facilitating enrichment clubs, chess club, cooking club, STEM club. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and so beyond the, the key zone after school program, our members are actually in uh, youth serving agencies across Duluth. So this is um, outside of our partnership with the school district. We're partnered with um, a number of youth serving agencies. I think there's, yep, there. So we are working in, in anywhere that there's kids after school, um, America members are there um, uh, pretty much. So we're at Valley Youth Center, we're at Neighborhood Youth Services, um, and, and we have about uh, 16 members supporting these students. And, and they're, yeah, the, Duluth's most vulnerable kids are receiving services from True North America at, at, at one of these sites or at one of the schools. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, this impact also carries over to summer. Um, our members have that year-long commitment, and they're supporting um, Key Zone, which runs full-time in the summer. Um, they're there doing field trips. Um, we, they are actually liaisons with Youth Outdoors Duluth, another YMCA program focused on getting kids out, outdoors. Um, they're trained in the Youth Outdoors Duluth curriculum, and they are actually the ones who bring the curriculum into the after-school programs and facilitate the um, curriculum in the after-school programs. And then lastly, I think it's, uh, I should be honest, this isn't lastly. <laughs> um, our, our AmeriCorps members are highly trained, um, and I think that's an important thing to recognize. These aren't just, you know, volunteers who come in a couple hours a week. Um, we actually start with a, a week-long training institute for our AmeriCorps members in the fall before they set foot in a school. They are getting behavior management, um, the positive behavior intervention and supports um, that um, Principal Shimon was talking about. Uh, they get trauma-informed care. The, they get race, class, and gender consciousness training. They um, are in math intervention training. All of those, uh, they're, they're showing up ready to uh, do their service on day one. Um, yeah, and so I, I think it's important to reflect that if we're being 
honest, it's a pretty tall order for us to expect our teachers to uh, simultaneously connect with, uh, connect with students in a deep, meaningful way, grade papers, communicate with teachers, plan and execute lessons. It's a pretty tall order. And that's why I think it's so important that there's AmeriCorps members in the school building to support the teachers and to support the students as well. Um, our AmeriCorps members are the welcoming faces that are at the school door um, welcoming students off the bus. They're there a little bit later pulling students into their intervention room and walking them slowly through a, a difficult math concept. And then they're there after school um, doing, encouraging kids to try new things, try scavenger hunt club, which is a real thing at Laurel MacArthur and it's amazing. Um, they're, they're the consistent face throughout the day, and I think that, that has a, a, an emotional and a, a social and emotional impact on the, on the students. Um, and, and that's why we, I just want to jump back to close out this infographic on the front side, the increased academic engagement is a result of that, uh, we believe. Uh, we had the um, teachers, so the teachers of the students that our AmeriCorps members work with, um, they did the federal teacher surveys, uh, which is an, a measure of academic engagement. Um, and those teachers said that the students that our AmeriCorps members work with, I believe it's 81% improved in academic performance, 72% had increased class participation, and 69% um, increased in their um, satisfactory homework completion. Um, we believe that learning is a relational act. Uh, we believe that the connection between a child and her educators is the most uh, it's the cornerstone of education. Um, you know, a school can have the the most well-researched curriculum, can have the sparkling uh, recess, you know, sparkling playground, but if a, if a student isn't feeling connected to our educators, if a student isn't feeling connected to the school, not much learning is going to happen. And, and we really believe that AmeriCorps members are the people, are, are among the many people in the schools that that can um, serve as that that rootedness in the school that helps students launch further, um, and, and then if you're at the bottom of our of our infographic, you can see that we do a little cost um, breakdown. Um, if you're going to spend any spend money on on anything, I mean, why not spend money on more caring? Human beings who can who can connect with students and walk them through some of those some of those um, tough uh, academic and life issues. Um, what we want to close with is a brief video that kind of does all the things that an infographic and a dude talking can't do, um, which is uh, like yeah, communicate the impact. Uh oh, we might need some internet. Oh. Is it not there? I don't think so. That doesn't look buffered to me. Um, we might not be watching the video, but that's what email's for. I think you may have the link. I, I sent it on with the agenda, info, so I think you may have the link somewhere in your info. Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a non district yeah. computer. Yeah. Okay. Not going to work. We'll give it one more shot. That works. Okay. Here we go. Cool. <laughs> just raised your score. <laughs> <laughs> that is not funny. <laughs> I'm nervous enough as it is, okay? All right. Here we go. Can, we, can you turn it up to the... Is it this one? It's right, right there. I'll give you a little bit of context. This is our Global Youth Service Day, and this is our AmeriCorps members engaging students across Duluth in service learning projects. Um, and uh, they do this every year, and um, it is an, a True North AmeriCorps uh, project. So the people who are speaking are our members. Walking limbs, climb the fence, books and plans, I can tell that we are gonna be friends. I can tell that we are gonna be friends. Today we're working with a global youth service day 
and it's an opportunity across the world for students and uh, uh, mentor volunteers to encourage uh, young people to get involved uh, in addressing some of the world's problems. Right here, the students have chosen to create a garden so that uh, they can learn more about sustainability and they can provide fresh produce for their families over the summer. Our student council, Keyzone, and Compass After School programs have done a clothing, book, and food drive. So they wrote letters to the president expressing their concerns about what's happening in the United States. And then they also did research on children that have made an impact on the world and have changed because they spoke up. Today we are having an all-school eco day. We also plan to uh, put in some other environmental kinds of things to the, into the school this, uh, the rest of the school year. So we'll have um, an outdoor hike that includes a new live camera for the kids to use. And then also in the composting area in the school, we'll be um, working with the kids to supplement that. So the kids are having um, a real true connection with their community because they're bringing goods in to the school to give back to Chum and Damiano. So they're really having this um, open-minded experience of learning how they can serve their community. I guess one thing I've definitely learned is more about my community, and I live right here in this community where I work and volunteer, so it's been really great to get to know my community better and really feel like I'm giving back here. Thank you all for coming and being a part of this night, uh, for helping to create these care packages that will go to kids who are um, in the pediatric wing at St. Luke's. Global Youth Service Day to me is making opportunities for youth to go out and serve their community, not just their local Duluth community, but even the greater community, and see what it's like to serve others and do things for others that they typically don't do in their day-to-day -day lives. Leach owes St. Luke's to work with to do our Global Youth Service Project, which we have created Brain Boxes. Thank you, Laura Mack to St. Luke's Hospital. It is amazing to see this busload of kids come out with these beautiful bright color boxes. Their stories of empathy, of understanding how, it, how cancer is impacting kids at their school and, and kids that they know and love. And uh, for me, as a mayor and as an adult in this community, to just be re-inspired to do everything we can to show empathy and compassion for others when they are struggling. So thank you for all that you do. This is a project um, and opening up their eyes to the fact that even though they're children they can still make change happen in the world and um, be the change that they want to see also. I've come to appreciate how brilliant our young people can be if they're just given the opportunity to be nurtured and grow. For me I'm a lot more quiet in person, and I have a lot of social anxiety, but when I'm with kids, I feel a lot more like I can just be crazy and be random and have fun with them and not worry about, like, I look really weird right now. <laughs> so it's kind of nice just to have that, embrace that personality that I didn't realize I had. It's definitely been a joy working with them every day. I am doing the program next year. Yeah. It's been a really humbling experience. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for watching. Um, we, yeah, our program is reliant on our partnership with the school district, and um, we look forward to another 14 years of, of partnering and, and providing the services to kids. Thanks, Chris and Sarah. Questions? Member Trinka. I have a quick Comments? question. Um, Thank you for coming and sharing this with us. This is all really exciting. And um, as a parent who is a child in Keyzone, uh, Mr. Luke has been <laughs> absolutely um, 
molding and shaping our little guy for the last few years, and we're really grateful for him and the leadership of the folks at um, Myers Wilkins. Just a quick question um, for me to help me understand some of the reconciliation between the school district and our partners, especially as it pertains to discipline with our kiddos. I know when I pick Noah up at the end of the day, it is crazy in there. And so what is your process as partners in aligning discipline um, standards with what the standards are for the for ISD 709? Um, we follow the ISD 709, um, but after school is a, a different animal, so we do, we do you have a, a chart that we follow by. Um, we have a three strikes system, and we work closely with the families um, to alleviate some of those problems we're having because the parents understand their kids better than we do. Um, so we work really closely with the families to try to find a way to make things work for us and for the family. And we also connect with school day, the teachers, and any support staff out there that can help us with anything we need. But, you know, our, ultimately we want to keep as many kids in the program as we can, but we also know our limitations. Mm -hmm. I just, as I was, I'm thinking back on the Piedmont presentation about how they've managed to minimize their out-of-school suspensions and flip those programs around and recognizing that a lot of the parents or a lot of the families who have children in Key Zone have them there for a reason. And so three strikes to me seems, just from my outside perspective, to be slight, it's like, you know, three strikes and you're out. I get it that there's safety concerns and there's all those different pieces too, but wondering if there's some additional ways to adopt some of the really um, resilient work that's happening within the schools to do that after school as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't, I mean, the only support we can get is if we seek it out during the school day. We don't have that um, special support after school, so we do the best that we can and you know, we may ask a parent just to exit their child and with a possibility of coming back in the future once the child has, um, they might have some issues that we just don't know how to work with and because of our racials, we can't. But we, it's a last resort to have kids taken out of the program. We, we want to work with them and we want to keep them with us. Uh, it doesn't happen probably very often that we have to release children, but because we're not trained and we don't have that support after school to help us with that, sometimes we just don't have any other choices. And we work with the families. It, it's a long process before we get to that point. Um, and I, I, I have utmost respect for all our site coordinators. They work really hard to make things work, and they bring Melissa and I into the process, and, and we're there, too. We know what's going on, um, so it, we don't take it lightly. We, we want the kids there because they need us as, you know, as much as we need them to be there, um, and I think it's good for kids to learn how to navigate those feelings. Um, we do our best. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, just sort of an overview for everybody watching. You guys are at eight elementary sites for Keyzone, and I'm wondering about how many, um, if you have wait lists, if there's a demand, um, what the summer is looking like in terms of if you're going to be at the same sites. I think there's YMCA now. Could you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, uh, we're actually at all nine elementaries. And, uh, in fact, this year, be, because of our large numbers at Congdon Elementary, we actually uh, partnered with the Y, and we have Congdon, I forget what we call it, but, but it's our satellite site for mm -hmm. overflow. So those kids actually get bused to, to the YMCA after school. And we've worked hard across the district not to have waiting lists mm -hmm. uh, so that any child that once the service can get into the program. And right now we currently have none on the waiting list. Summer sites, uh, we reduce our sites in the summer to four this year. Uh, and those will be at Congdon, Lester Park, uh, Laura Mack, and Myers Wilkins.
I'm just going to thank you for coming and um, know that we've got all of this great information. And oh, oh you're just too close. I'm so, too, Josh, I, I was too shy to chime in there. Thanks, everybody. Um, no, <laughs> um, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, recognize the partnership between the City of Duluth, the YMCA, AmeriCorps, um, and Community Ed. Uh, clearly, that collaboration and partnership is is generating a lot for our students. So, thank you for coming and sharing about that uh, tonight. And um, yeah, appreciate it. Chris, you get an A plus from the public speaking teacher. <clears throat> Um, I love the, yeah, I, I even gave you a little critique like of some of the stronger lines, but I can give that to you as a student. Good job. <laughs> Up next is our secondary schedule task force update. So we're going to move them out. But again, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Say something. Dr. Carey wants to say something. Okay. Um, as, as we're getting connected, I just want to say, no, come on up, everyone. Um, just want to say thank you to everybody from the team that's here. Um, no offense to our previous presenters, they did a great job, um, but we were anticipating, I think, about 45 to, or 15 to 20 minutes per presentation, which would have meant that this group would have started around 5 o'clock or 5.15, um, and it's now 6 p.m., and so I just want to say thank you for your patience to those who have been able to stay. We did have some people who were here who had to leave due to other commitments. Um, and so just want to honor the fact that um, we put this presentation in the place in the agenda where it's located because we felt it was going to be some real um, deep and potentially meaty conversation around it. Um, and so uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for um, waiting until 6 p.m. for us to get started. Um, also, I just want to say on that note, there's a Denville East basketball game at seven, and I'm I gotta go. So, when it's time, it's time. So, quick question: Who's plugged in currently right now for the presentation? Okay, and you have the most recent version. Okay, so for board members, one thing I want to let you know is that from the time we put out the board packet until today, we have been working on this draft. You'll notice it says in big letters, working draft in progress. And so the one that is in your board packet is slightly different in a few different aspects from the one you're going to see tonight. Um, we will update this for you going forward. And some of the links and other resources that you don't have in your packet, I brought paper copies here today. Um, so that you have them for this presentation and know that by next week, um, at the, or not next week, two weeks from tonight, at the formal board meeting, we will have all of that updated for you. Thank you. All right, so Danette, would you, in interest of time, would you please move us to the first slide? because I get the fun of introducing this to everyone. Um, so some of you were on the board at the time this decision was made. Some of us, some of you are new um, since then. And so we wanted to make sure that you knew um, the background and history behind this if you weren't already comfortable and familiar with that. Um, it happened last spring. We had some serious conversation um, around kind of desires from our community about what they would like to see in our secondary schools in terms of uh, course options for their students. Um, the general feedback was that we wanted more course choice for students than what we're able to provide in the six period day. Um, there was even discussion about potentially voting at that board meeting to go to a seven period day. And part of the conversation I think that we brought up as an administrative team is that there are a lot of schedules and schedule options that are available across the country and state and that it would be best to explore those in depth um, and look at some of the um, priorities of our community to then come back to you and provide feedback around what schedules or schedule options may be 
best help us to achieve our goals. And so we put together a process at the directive of the board um, that has began, I would say, last March. Um, and part of that was convening a secondary schedule task force. Um, all of the people here today have been members of that task force. And the task force met um, initially starting in June. So we've been working on this. Um, fairly intensely throughout the school year amongst the other responsibilities that everybody here has um, to try to make good progress and do a lot of deep research and analysis of what schedule options would really meet the desires of our community. So to give a little background, we wanted first to know what our community wanted. So. We, I worked with, with Dr. Lake and other members of our district to put together a survey that listed a number of different um, things or factors or priorities someone could have for a schedule. Um, we shared that with parents, with staff, with students. Um, we had, I think, very good response, especially from our parent group. We had over a thousand parents respond. Um, and in that survey, um, we asked people to pick their top choices from a list of priorities. That was intentional um, because no, no schedule can serve all needs or desires, so we wanted people to prioritize those for us, and we felt by constraining the choices and making them pick their top options, that would really give us a strong view of what our community priorities are. So with that, we wanted to make sure that we had um, some deliverables for the group, meaning what are they going to provide to all of you? And that was we wanted to come up with um, anywhere from two to five top schedule options that will be presented to the board um, at the completion of this process, along with other information around potential costs um, and the work that would need to be done to implement um, any one of those new options so that as a board um, you have the information you need to make a well-informed decision on how we move forward as a district um, with our schedule at our secondary sites. So we're going to cover really quickly just some general considerations, process, and timeline. I'm not going to belabor it. You can see who the members are, and we have people here today. Um, within the presentation, um, there are some basic deadlines that we have been working towards hitting. I'd say we did a great job of staying on track with those deadlines through about November. Um, and then after some conversation, we realized we needed to adjust our, our timelines and expectations a little bit to incorporate more feedback from our schools and from our teaching staff. Um, part of that process is that we wanted you to hear the message here first tonight. Um, but we also don't want to be doing the bulk of our communication through our news media, no offense to our news media, um, but we also like to talk directly to our staff and let them hear information from us directly. So we have presentations also scheduled tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday morning and Thursday afternoon at each of our secondary schools for our staff so that we can bring this information straight to them and they have opportunity to give us feedback. So if you take a look, just for background, we reviewed approximately 35 schedule options um, and many different variable schedules within each major schedule format. So we wanted to take a, a very organized way of looking at all of the schedule options um, to narrow them down. So the process that we used is we identified our three um, key strategies that our district is using to close the achievement cap and to increase achievement for all students. Those three um, initiatives are MTSS, or multi-tiered systems of support, which is just a framework that we use um, that you've heard in our um, CIT presentations. It's a framework that we use to um, individualize our instruction for students. Um, PLCs, or professional learning communities, uh, that's time for teachers to work together collaboratively um, to look at ways of improving student achievement. And then the third one being safe and welcoming environments for all students. So what we did is we looked at what are the key characteristics of each of those initiatives for them to be successful. So you can see bulleted there um, the kinds of things that um, are included. What we did then is we, determined, we created rubrics for each of those initiatives. 
that, so for example, under multi-tiered systems of support, one thing that's really important is to have um, time for interventions from highly qualified teachers. We need to have time built into our schedules. So in our current secondary schedule of only six periods, we, there really isn't a free period of time or free periods of time for students to get those high quality interventions. So we created rubrics that looked at whether or not the schedules met, um, exceeded or did not meet each of those key characteristics. We also took a really close look at the survey results from staff, students, and parents, and we looked, we ranked the top choices by all of the groups. Um, you can see from the bulleted list there were quite a few things um, with some common themes, but the ones that came to the top were enrolling in a number of electives, having access to college courses, access to career in tech ed. Um, I won't read the rest of them to you, but they, they, a lot of them did revolve around having um, good periods of time during the day to do things like engage in critical thinking. I'll take this one because I think it was for someone who left. Um, so we wanted to give you some examples of some of the options that rose to the top and some that we really took a long, hard look at. So we included them here just so you could have a sampling of the different variations of schedules we looked at. Not all 35 plus options are in here. Uh, the, at some point we split into high school and middle school teams to further evaluate our schedules and so we wanted Making a schedule to the minute for uh, about 20 different options was overwhelming, and so in order to save our brains, we stretched our day from 9 to 4. That doesn't mean that we would need to do that, but just as our basic basis for comparison, it's a 9 to 4 school day rather than 9.05 to 3.24. Um, so it stretches a little bit, and so you'll see that uh, identified in here that um, just as a basis for comparison to compare minutes to the hour and to the year, uh, that's what we used. So the chart you're looking at looks a little bit cumbersome. There's a lot of information on it. Um, but it, we wanted to include the district priorities and then also include all of the information that came out of the survey results. And we kind of used it as a kind of a beginning so we could compare it in order to narrow down the options that were on the table. So I guess I want to point out with that last page and this page here, there's a lot of information to digest here. Um, and we can't possibly give you enough time right now to look at it all but it will be a good reference for you to go back. This chart, while the previous chart looks at the, the key strategies in the district and compares them to see if the, the schedules meet those, this gives you a practical look at each schedule, um, how many classes would be taught per day, uh, how many students per teacher per term based on 35 kids in a class, uh, student minutes in class per day, um, student minutes in a class per day or block period, whether they had a block or not, and then I think one of the highlights there, the last two columns, hours per term in a class, like how many hours is a kid actually going to be in a class based on what the schedule looks like, and then finally how many credits are available for that student overall for the year. I'll also remind you that we did that for way more options than you saw there, um, but just so that you could read the, the chart, it's really just the ones that we've presented here as our narrowed down focus areas. So just as a basis to start, again, this wasn't my slide, but I'll take it because somebody left. Um, this is our current six period day schedule, just so you can see what it looks like. The 4A and second lunch go together, that's why they're both yellow on here. And then lunch, the first lunch and period 4B go together, essentially, so that's why we color coded those. This is considered a seven period modified block. Um, three days for the week they would have the same classes all day long and on two days per week they'd have what are considered blocks so there are longer periods of time for teachers to do such things as projects or labs if it's for a science class um, maybe they want somebody to come in and speak and they need a longer period of time it would allow for that 
and then one class in order to accommodate lunch would be all year long and would be a smaller time or a skinny it could be called this these are several variations of a seven period day this is the seven period a b so as you're looking at it it certainly doesn't look like a seven period day but that's because you're getting a period every other day so you have freshman seminar is one period freshman choir german one phi ed um, english is your skinny for all year and again any year-long course could be placed in there you have your win period and then geometry and physical science round that out so when you actually add up the two days you're actually looking at a seven period schedule but again the benefit of this is um, that it does allow for block time periods so you have a longer amount of time per class So if you've been around for a while, you knew what the seven period day looked like. And this kind of just goes back to a little bit more of the roots of what had been done before we changed to a six period day. One thing to note with all of the schedule options are that WIN is continued and is included because of the work that has gone into WIN, the interventions, MTSS, and also the PLCs. Okay, these two I think were really mine. <clears throat> We're showing you two five by five trimester options and initially when we started looking at the, the trimester um, there were concerns about certain courses only meeting for two thirds of the year uh, in a true five by five try. A full year course drops down to two trimesters and so there would be a gap potentially for some of those courses. So one of the options we looked at um, split into an A-B day so you could take two classes during that time but they would stretch out for the whole year. Uh, if you flip back up to our time comparison, you'll see that essentially that drops for advanced band or AP language and composition, our two examples here, um, all about two-thirds less time during the year. So it was a significant drop in time. You don't lose as much time in, you, in a two-trimester because in this model you're only getting those classes half of the year instead of two-thirds of the year, if that makes sense. Um, so you will see two of the AB or the five by five trimester options we looked at. Um, you'll also see that in some of our examples, we still included that. Um, whoops, uh, our CTE classes could and should still be blocked out at some point in there. So that's why construction is over two periods um, to allow students time to travel between buildings or to work sites. So this is the true pure five by five trimester with no A, B option. So all classes would have to be two thirds of the year or what is now a semester class would become one third of the year, but the periods stretch out, if that makes sense. So can I, I, I wanna interject something for our board members who haven't been privy to a lot of the background conversation we've had and we may need to add something to this presentation now that I'm thinking about it. Um, when you take a look at schedules, assuming that you start your day and end your day at roughly the same time, you're really playing with a few different factors, right? One factor is you're either shortening the amount of the year that a course meets in order to be able to add additional options, or you're shortening the period of time in a day the course meets in order to add additional options. Our current six period day, one of the advantages of it, because it does have advantages, is that it allows for one of the highest amounts of time in an individual course over an entire year. Meaning if you're taking a year long course in the six period day, you get almost as much time in that course in that model as any other model. Now, as you move to provide more course choices, right, more courses a student can take, you lose some of the amount of time you would have had in an individual course, if that makes sense. So basically, you're giving up time um, during the year in one course to create an opportunity to take another course, right? And so the factor that you're playing with when you're looking at different schedule options is how much time are we cutting out of each current course to add new courses and are we doing that by either shortening the class period or by shortening the number of days it meets in a year. 
right? Those are really the factors you're leveraging around. And we didn't talk about that at the onset here, um, but as you get a chance to dig in, look at some of the information here and ask questions, that's the piece you're trying to look at, is how are we slicing the use of that finite time um, to maximize the amount of course options we have for kids, and at the same time, consider the impacts that has on the amount of time in an individual course that a teacher gets to spend with those students. Does that make sense? Okay. Sure. So the middle school, we looked at the time frame from 8.45 to 3.15. That's our current schedule right now, but some of these may, may adjust as well. Um, and we met as a middle school team separate from the high school team. Um, examined several schedules. And so um, this first slide has a lot of information on it. Um, looking at wind time being a part of every single schedule. Um, passing time, lunch. Uh, class length really varies when we look at the four schedules, our current schedule and three other schedules, but you can really see on here from 49, 44, 60 to 85 and 40, like larger blocks and skinny blocks. Um, so it really ranges. And then the total minutes um, of the day. So this is kind of a summary of everything. So I would encourage you when you have time really um, look at this one. We could, we could spend a lot of time on it. Okay, so we narrowed down to three. Is that how this works? Okay, on the previous one, just for clarification, it was based on the time we actually have now. Um, 745 to 345, nothing changed, fitted in how it worked now. That's what we thought we were working with, so when we broke into our different groups, just so you know, we looked at that. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of what the classes would look like. And so in sixth grade, is that the sixth one on the left-hand side? Uh, eighth grade. Eighth grade on the far side. Okay, eighth grade's on the far side. Um, there are some based on what our school district requires. They have to take certain classes. Thank you. And so those are plugged in. These are just a draft. It doesn't mean that third hour you're gonna have English. Okay, so I want people to understand that this is just how we did that. And the electives, the star on the electives mean that would be an extra. Okay, so that's Above what, what the uh, students currently, currently have, have now. What they have. So the yellow highlighted and Right. Start. So then um, we have the straight seven period day, which we don't need to talk about that one because everybody knows that one or thinks they do. Um, the middle school, um, four by four hybrid, and then you get into, as uh, Penny talked about, um, possibility of some skinnies that you can put in there, and uh, the stars, once again, mean that there's an opportunity for um, electives or enrichment or it determines to be determined. Five block trimester, same thing. It's pretty... I don't know, to me it's pretty self-explanatory as you look at the different options and you go back. But um, the big key is going to the first one for us is the time difference on all those. And I'm fortunate that <coughs> Gina Clive put that together and uh, put that up there for us and to start it. And I found that to be very helpful as far as how things go. And that's pretty much what we came up with with middle. Dean is back there hiding out in the back row. So. Uh, okay. uh, just one of the things, again, looking why we split up in middle school and high school. Um, for those of you that have thought, uh, there is a big difference between a middle school student and a high school student. And one of the areas that we really looked at is transitions. And so that's a big consideration as far as middle school compared to high school because, again, if we have more transitions with middle school students, they struggle to get back on track more than, let's say, a high school student in most cases. And other things, just kind of when you look at some of the things that we've had in the past and uh, what we're looking at and what we have right now, 
difference as far as, and Mike, you can maybe quote you on this, mm -hmm. uh, between any schedule other than what your district wants and what your district needs? As far as what happens with the student um, learning, there's no information out there, correct? What, what Mr. Harold is, is referring to is that um, leading into the process, I had gone to different databases and found a bunch of research articles on the impacts of different schedule options in terms of student learning so that people would have that information. We could share that with the task force so they could consider that before they started their work. Um, and while there is a little bit of data from some places that there might be some minor variation between schedules, most of the research stated they couldn't kind of empirically prove um, any a real correlation between a specific schedule option and improved student achievement. And many of them deferred back to that it's really the desires of your local community um, that should or would most reasonably drive um, what type of schedule makes sense for you and really the needs of your local community. Um, so not only the priorities and wants, but your needs. What are the things you're trying to address as a community? Um, so when we shared that, that really, I think, opened up our ability to look at a number of options because we knew, at least on the research we were able to find, there wasn't a strong connection between a specific schedule and high student achievement. Um, so before we roll into cost considerations, um, just to recap, our high school team identified the seven period modified block, which they shared, and that was the combination of three days a week or seven period days, and then two days a week courses meet as blocks, so it provides a larger chunk of time to try different instructional strategies. They also identified a seven period AB. And what that is, is it's actually three block periods per day um, and then that alternate every other day so that you're taking three classes on one day that are in a big block and then three different classes the next day alternating. And then you have a seventh class that's what we call a skinny period or it's half the length of a block. Right? So the students are still getting seven periods a year, but th six of those classes meet in big chunks of time. One of those classes meets in a skinnier chunk of time throughout the year. Um, the other options they identified were just the straight seven period day, which is you go to seven classes a day and all the periods are of the same length. Um, so that's the, I'd say, traditional option that we have had historically in Duluth. And then the other options were the five period trimester. And just to recap, what that is is a student has five periods per day, so their classes each day would be longer in time than their current, but those classes only meet for either two thirds of a year, if they were traditionally a year long class, or if they were a semester class, they now meet for one third of the year. So those are the, just a quick recap of what the high schools identified as their top options. The middle level covered a straight seven period day. Again, kind of what we're traditionally used to before some of our more recent schedule adjustments as a city. Um, and then also a version of the four by four block, right? Meaning you have four big blocks of time per day and classes can either meet in that big block of time and meet kind of on an every other day basis or you can chunk those pieces of time into what we call another skinny period, which is half the length of a block, right? So that's another schedule we talked about. And then again, the middle school also identified that five period trimester that I just talked about. So those are the kind of recommendations at current from those two groups. Um, and maybe as a team, we'll put a summary slide at the end of each section that states again for everyone what those are might be a, something for us to consider. So on to the next part which is what does this all cost? Um, and so uh, first leading into that we want to talk before we get into the money a little bit, a little bit about potential staffing impacts that we would anticipate. Right? Um, every single one of these schedules, because we're giving kids more courses, leads to the need for adding staff. But 
the key caveat here is that some of these options wouldn't necessarily universally add staff across all of our content areas. And depending on student course taking patterns, it could potentially lead to needing fewer staff in a specific content area. Now how that would work out, we really don't know at this point because it all depends on what types of courses and elective courses students choose to enroll in, right? Which is something we can't really accurately predict. Um, so I think you can see in that table that's in front of you that it's in your presentation and it's also in your handout, each of the different schedule options being considered and then some anticipated um, impacts on certified staff. We're really in that example only looking at our teaching staff. Um, so you can look at those, review those, and if you have questions about that, we'd be happy to answer that. Moving forward to actual cost. Um, if somebody could click on that initial staffing cost increase. All right. So you can look and if we can maybe blow that up a little bit bigger so that people can see on the screen. So we've broken this down into cost at the middle school and cost at the high school. Um, because each level was looking at different schedule options and we would maybe there could be reasons why we would choose a different schedule at the middle versus the high school. We wanted to make sure that we broke down our cost estimates for each level. And so what we did to estimate these, cost, these costs is we used our standard kind of default rate that we've set for an average teacher, which is about $96,000 per year in terms of salary and benefits cost, right? That's combined total cost for that staff member on average. Um, we calculated how many additional staff members we would need um, in order to staff that new schedule using our current number of students at each level. So we used a rough estimate of our current number of middle school students, a rough estimate of our current number of high school students, and then figured out how many additional sections we would need if every student were taking the maximum number of courses that they could, and then use that information to figure out how many additional teachers we'd need, and then multiply that times our average cost per teacher. Right? And I can go through those calculations in more detail with individual members if you're interested. Um, you can see that the four period block, um, in our first year we would anticipate a staffing and cost increase of about $755,000 as a rough estimate. Knowing that that will go up or down depending on who the actual teachers are that we would hire and where they fall in our salary schedule, right? So those are factors that we can't, we can't build into that number. Um, if you look at the cost of the five period trimester at the middle school for certified teaching staff, that would be an increase of a little over $283,000. And if you look at the cost of the seven period day, that would add about $1.13 million in additional cost. That's across the whole district. That's district wide across the middle school. Yep. Um, now if you take, take a look, um, some of these options assumed an increase to the length of the student day above where we're currently at. And the seven period option that we were originally looking at did assume a slightly longer student contact day than what we currently have, whereas the other options didn't. So we wanted to build in some estimation of costs for paraprofessionals and other staff. You can take a look and that initial cost with work from, working with our finance department was about an $86,000 cost increase for those additional non-certified support staff. So if you go to the bottom of that chart, we would anticipate, depending on our options, for a four period block, we'd estimate an increase of about $755,000 in staff. For the five period trimester, we'd estimate about $283,000 in additional cost. And then for the seven period day, we would estimate just a little over $1.2 million in additional extra cost for just our middle level. 
if you go to our high school, you'll see that we've clumped all the seven period options together um, because you really are allowing the student to take seven periods. Um, the cost factors are roughly the same across each one of the options. Um, and so you really only at that level had the five period trimester to compare against all of the seven period options that were laid out. If you take a look, the, because our, our high schools serve four grade levels, right, instead of three, they're bigger, um, and you have more students, so the increase for that five period trimester at the high school level, you'll notice is more than the cost at the middle level, and it's about $417,000, very roughly speaking. Um, and then for the seven period options in terms of increase in certified staff, again, it was an additional $1.46 million to move forward with that option. Now if you go to non-certified, um, depending on how we would set up the day, one of the options was to extend the start time of the day, like we did at the middle level, and if you were to do that same work in terms of extending the length of the day, there was that same non-certified staff cost we had to consider, and we've estimated that at a little over an extra $100,000 per year. So when you scroll down to the bottom, you see that from the high school options, the five period trimester is really the cost of the increased certified staff, which is about 417000 again. And then for the seven period options, um, assuming that we would stretch the length of the day to accommodate that seventh period, you have to add those two costs together and you come up with a little over one and a half million dollars, about $1.56 million for those, for those options. So that's the staffing costs. Um, it's key to note that there are a number of other costs that could be considered. Um, also in this estimate, um, if somebody would be so kind as to click on that link, you will see that we also, can, we also put in a 10-year, year-by-year estimate of staffing costs. Um, our superintendent um, asked me to try to, within reasonable parameters, um, project what we would expect our staffing costs to be year by year, five to ten years down the road, knowing that we have things like increases to salaries, we have things like increases to benefits costs. And so um, in this chart, for the fiscal years where we have contracts settled, I used the increase that we have in our certified contracts. Um, for the years where we don't have contracts settled, since a common amount over recent years has been a 2% increase, I used a 2% salary increase as, as our estimate. Um, and then for the benefits, we used a 6% increase. Now I want to note that that would be higher than what we've experienced on average over recent years, but it's certainly not the highest mark we've seen in recent years. Um, so the intent was to try to come up with a cost estimate that was reasonable, but maybe a little bit on the high side. So that, uh, let me, to back up, I always believe estimate your costs high and your revenues low, right? Um, that way you don't ever end up in financial trouble, right? And so part of it was we want to estimate our costs here a little bit high. Um, so that we're making sure that if you choose to move forward with one of these options, um, hopefully the real cost would come in a little under what this says and you're sitting in a good position, right? That's the goal. Um, so we've used that 2% and 6% respectively for most of the years. We assumed that our salary cost was about 75% of our cost of a staff member and that our benefits cost was about 25% in that calculation. And are you projecting any increases in student volume, or is this based off of? This is based on current student volume. Okay. It's assuming no change in our student numbers from right now. Um, and so what you'll see is I've laid out the costs for each schedule for each year over the next 10 years and calculated a five-year average for the first five years in this span and a 10-year average over the whole 10-year period. Um, and done that for each the middle school and high school level fiscal year by fiscal year. On the bottom, what that is is it's an attempt to put together every possible combination of schedules you could choose from this list so that you could see the total overall cost year by year 
for each each combination of schedule options that the board could potentially choose. Okay. Thanks. All right. So you have that information there. All right. So can then I, the can next. Can I ask a quick question before you move on? Sure. To the next section. Can I presume that an increase in staff would mean that we're going to have smaller classes, class sizes? No. In some of these. That that increase in staff is assuming the current ratio that we now experience as a district. So if you take a look, um, when you look at the ratio of FTE that our given out to each of our buildings. At the secondary level, our principals need to use some of that FTE to staff counselors and staff library media specialists and other positions. So the actual average class size across our secondaries is slightly higher than the ratio we utilize. And so we used a number, I think the number I used was about 1 to 32, because um, that that tends to be about where we average out. Our average class size across our whole secondary is typically around 32 students per course. Um, and what should be noted is those, those increased costs in the 10-year staffing estimate are just the increases for the new staff. Right? That doesn't include any increases to current existing staff. Okay. So that's just for the new people we would add, not for the people we already have. Okay. Okay, so next slide. Um, we asked Mike Johnson to work um, with the Transportation Department and then our bus contractor, Voyager, to come up with a potential transportation um, cost. Now, for most of our schedule options, they assumed that school starts and ends at the same time that it currently does, which means there would be no need for any drastic changes to our busing, uh, which would mean no additional transportation cost across the district above current. Um, for the seven period option, the straight seven period day, if we push the start of the school day earlier, right? kind of into where zero hour currently exists in our high schools. That would mean major changes to our busing system. We currently have what um, Mr. Johnson calls a two-tier busing system, which means our buses go out and pick up elementary kids, and then they go out and pick up our high school and middle school kids. If we were to push the start of our student day earlier, it would no longer allow for that additional tier of busing, and we would need more buses and more bus drivers in order to accommodate that. In your actual handouts that I've given you, you can see the full um, memo that Mike shared with me. Um, so you have not only the information I've included on this slide, but some rationale, an explanation for how he arrived at those numbers. Um, he said he'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about that if you'd like to reach out to him. But what you can see is that if we push the start of a seven period day too far forward, where we collapse down to a single tier of busing, you'd need to add 27 additional buses at an extra cost of $266.50 per bus per day times 173 school days. So you're looking at a $1.25 million increase in transportation. And that's for our general education standard transportation. Um, we also have specialized busing for our students that need special accommodations. And he also lists the number of additional special needs buses that would need to be included, times that daily rate and number of days, and it gives you an increase of about $612,000. So in order to shift that school day forward, it would be an additional cost of about $1.85 million per year in transportation. And this is predicated on the utilization of this bus schedule not partnering with DTA or utilizing other existing <coughs> transportation routes, right? It's just working with Voyager. This is just working okay. with Voyager, correct. And this is only if the day is shifted earlier. Correct. It wouldn't apply if the day is shifted later. Correct. If the day is shifted later, there are some marginal cost increases because of how our contracts are structured. I don't know the details. Mike could answer that very clearly. But what he said is um, the day going later has only a marginal impact 
on the cost of transportation. The considerations you have to add in then is how that impacts student activities at our secondary schools and their travel time to the places they go to participate. And then also, you know, other considerations would be students who work after school, um, students who are caregivers for their younger siblings. Um, you'd have to think about some of those impacts um, if you pushed the day later. All right. Now, depending on which option we would choose as well, um, you could have some potential costs for curriculum revision. Um, the example I would give is currently our six period day classes meet for, I think it's 48 minutes, and they meet all year long um, or for a semester. Um, now the seven period day options, at least the straight seven period day option, let me clarify that. So that's the traditional you meet for 40 some minutes a day all year long option. Um, we would have very little if any um, curriculum revision costs needed in that one. So it may be more expensive in a lot of ways, but for curriculum revision, our curriculum is already written in a way where it's a semester long or year long course, and the changing from 48 to 44 minutes a day would do very little to impact the pacing of our units or the content we cover and the content within our assessments. So it wouldn't really need a whole lot of adjustment for that schedule. For any other schedule, the more radically we kind of diverge from that, um, we need to think about um, the total time we spend in the course. Um, we need to think about how many units we can fit within the number of days that we have students. We need to think about whether or not that requires um, any content to be taken from courses that is maybe additional and unnecessary, and that also impacts um, our assessments and the tests we give, right? So to give you just a very, very rough estimate of what that cost would be, I made some kind of, I'm just gonna be honest, kind of wild assumptions here, right? Um, they really are, and I have very little confidence in these numbers. I just wanna be very clear about that. Um, if you assume that we could take a current course and restructure that course, um, rewrite the units and rewrite the assessments, I, I use two different numbers. One was that it would take two teachers a week worth of work at our current curriculum writing rate. The other was thinking that might not be enough time. They might really need two teachers, take two weeks um, to redo that work. Um, it may take longer than that but that was just the base estimate I used. When you figure that out, if we were to spend, if we were to work on only our 55 to 60 required courses that pretty much all students take or their equipment at the middle and high school, you'd be looking at a cost of anywhere from about 175 to $385,000 in curriculum rework that would have to be done on the front end to make sure that our courses would now match our new structure so that teachers would be able to successfully implement those. If you tried to do all 215 courses that we have about, across both of our course guides at both levels, you're now looking at a cost of about $690,000 to about 1.3, 1.4 million. Um, to be completely honest, we don't have our, all of our elective courses fully scoped and sequenced with unit documents and pacing guides. We do have it done right now for all of our required courses and then a few of our other more highly um, highly taken or participated in courses. Um, so the more realistic number is probably the first one, um, but I just want you to see where the cost could go if we really dove in to our curriculum work to accommodate a new schedule. I feel like one of those students that when they're sitting in our classes and they've, they've gotten a lot of information and they start shutting down and then they don't have hope anymore, it's kind of like, holy man, just... <laughs> so then the last slide is questions. I'll take the last slide since Joan and I just added it today. And then we're going to go to a um, basketball game. Go Hounds. <clears throat> um, so what? That's okay. Go Hounds because the Hunters won the first game. I know. It's our turn. It's our house. Um, so when we present this to the staff over the next two days we wanted a tool to collect any feedback or thoughts we hadn't thought of yet um, so we they will be shared 
That was totally bad grammar, I'm sorry. Um, we will share with them this slideshow tomorrow um, after we have finished giving the presentations. And so then the link to um, give some feedback is right there. They'll also be able to just put it in writing during the presentation and hand it to us. We love our Google Forms here. Um, it shoots it right into a spreadsheet so everyone can see it. So when the team meets again, we can address what those questions were. So. So in closing and before we open up for questions, the one thing that I think is really important is, and I hope you take the time to ask members of the task force, our goal was to make sure this was a really collaborative process where everybody had input and say, and this isn't the end result of what any one individual would have preferred or liked. This is really a team approach that was intentionally taken to make sure we arrived at a group decision for how we may best serve our kids moving forward. <clears throat> Could I add some um, one thing and we also there's a lot of variables that we just can't figure out and so when we get to that point there will be a lot of things that this group hasn't thought about and one of the things that we weren't charged with was doing the money our charge was to see what the best schedule was and so I just want people to understand that we tried really hard to not let the what ifs get in the way because that's your job. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are a lot of what ifs, but um, this was, I think, just so people understand, we weren't charged with thinking about all the money and the what ifs and stuff, just the core request. Of course. Um, I have some questions, but I don't know that it necessitates those of you who need to drive safely to the basketball game. <laughs> um, but I think I'd be curious, I would be curious to see what some of the frequently asked questions are that come out of your sessions this week. So we can be really mindful of that too, because I think we've heard loud and clear this week how, well, never mind. Um, so that would be great. My question is twofold. One is around timelines. So you had a timeline up there, but I, did it include full implementation? No, and okay. it's an excellent question. One of the things that we haven't built into the presentation yet that has actually been intense conversation in the group is do not rush this. Right. If you do it too fast, it will lead to a half-done product that will be implemented poorly and our community will not be happy with what they get. Um, we really need to make sure that we give all of the pre-work that would need to be done to successfully implement this, the time that it deserves, so that it works well for students, it works well for families, and it works well for staff. Uh, I've already heard people trying to impose some potential timelines on this, um, and I, I caution against that, because this is not something we want to mess up. And then, so my, my other question is answered by this too, though, looking at um, community involvement and, st and additional stakeholder involvement, because um, as Member Gorham likes to say, people buy into what they help create, and I think we can see that from the robust work that you guys put into this, so thank you so much for really coming well prepared for this, but also wanting to make sure that we give adequate time for community input and feedback. Um, so to, to help answer that question, or I don't know if it's a question, but a statement, um, the, we're, we've been working with the superintendent recently to talk about um, planning a community opportunity where people can come to give feedback to all of the different initiatives we've been discussing. Um, not just this, but also our, an equity initiative and some of those other pieces. And so he is in the planning stages of trying to set up opportunities where we would go out into the community, let them come and share their feedback on a multiple of different, uh, sorry, multiple different major things we're engaging in, and then have them help prioritize what work they feel is most important. <coughs> If I may add, I really appreciate Dr. Carey's um, emphasis on the front end for it to be successful. That's really, really important. And just speaking just for myself and a couple others that aren't here, they wanted that stressed as well as that the front end work determines how successful it will be for the long haul. And that can't be emphasized enough. Ask the board to give 
us you know, feedback on what we should do going forward. So my, my reaction to that would be a couple of things. One, two, I, I wonder if we're looking at like the future of your committee. Are you in it for another you know, journey? Do you see that your committee would, would, others would opt out? I mean, how strong of a committee, you, you guys bought into this last year and now you know, we still have a journey, and so what does that look like? That would be mine, you know, my insight. I would also want to know, did, you, did we visit sites or have conversation with school districts that are on operating different schedules? And could we visit those? Is that another step in our journey? So we, we did not formally visit any sites. I do believe that different members of the group who may have had connections in other districts may have made phone calls and reached out and gotten some personal feedback on that. But we didn't as a team um, you know, engage in any conversation with a district that's currently implementing any one of these options. Um, in terms of, I don't want to speak for anyone in the group, um, but being the person charged with running and leading the group, I can just be very honest that it took a lot of work, a lot of effort, and these people have done an amazing job of, of giving their time and energy, um, but I think fatigue to a certain level is setting in for everyone in the group, um, and so if we're talking about next steps and next phases, my initial reaction would be that maybe we pull together another team for that if okay. teacher input's needed so that we can look at this with fresh eyes and maybe even have some mix between um, people that served on the current group because uh, I think everybody needs a little bit of a break, but that's just my opinion. Okay. And then I'm going to talk to Dean's comment as well about is March 18th maybe too soon You've got a, a wonderful outline and presentation and lots of hard work, and I think the community um, would appreciate and support this kind of presentation, especially based off of your staff um, presentations tomorrow. Based on our work during our campaigns and door knocking and listening to our community and just the rhetoric used, this was a talking point, and this was you know, important to community stakeholders. And so, one, I think you want to celebrate in March the work that you've already done and what you've gathered. I would caution us all to, um, I, don't, I don't, you know, I, I want truth, I do. But some of the numbers and some of the things are just overwhelming. And, and I can see our community saying, they're just doing this so we don't have to do it. Hmm. You know, they're just showing us these extravagant numbers because the community... Uh, and so somehow we also have to remember, too, that we are building trust. We've gone through some transitions ourselves as a board and as a community. So I want the community to see your hard work in all that it has shared with us. I'd really encourage in somebody to, to talk with other districts. I think that, that resonates with me anyway. As soon as I know that you've talked to Rochester or Mankato or I was at Roseville last week for a speech tournament and on their boards are all of their their daily schedules. So they are obviously on something um, that's not a six period day like we've got. So um, I would encourage us to, to, to do some presentations, but certainly a work in progress. And then continue to really um, highlight the good work and bring staff in or community. I don't know, where does this go? I don't know. Well, and, and I'd just like to note, too, with the timeline is, I mean, for those of us who were at the board meeting last year, the timeline was kind of just predetermined to be about this time. It wasn't like that, it wasn't that it was the timeline to make sense. It was within a year would come with a plan. And so even at the time the board had formed this task force, I think it is kind of more of that phase one of this task force was brought together to, to do this and come up with, here's the options. And then now that next phase would be the discussion of what is that, the site visits and some of the other options. Um, but I think for the point of this task force, it was trying to meet this deadline based on what the board had said last year. And I just, I just want to interject. I think there's a real fine balance here between delaying and acting. Because I see this as a potential huge step forward for the school district in a positive way to put us in a really competitive light amongst some of our competitors that we are around. 
So I think this can be a really positive thing. I don't think we want to delay too far. I think it also needs to be part of the planning going forward. When you think about passing a levy next year, getting the public to support a levy, this certainly would be taking place during the period that the levy exists. So it needs to be part of that conversation as far as your planning goes and what the priorities in that levy look like. I do see this as a fundamental thing that will not only satisfy people that are currently choosing the school district, but may be attractive for people who are coming into it and or considering us versus other options. So while we may be tired and there may be some fatigue setting in, I think there has to be a really fine balance between acting too quickly and delaying too much and missing a window. Um, this is really good work. This is the best work we can do as a district when we come together and put a lot of the research into it. And Dr. Carey's done a tremendous job leading this charge and doing a lot of the back work that we didn't have to even be part of. So I don't want to miss the opportunity because I think the opportunity is not necessarily right now this year or necessarily next year, but certainly within the next few. So it's got to be part of the levy discussion. Member Gorham. Yeah, with regard to going to the community in March, um, definitely some great points brought up. But I do think overall it is important to bring our community along in the conversation. This was um, a directive of the previous, uh, how long ago was it? it a year. a year ago. It so was about a year ago. I, I think um, I think bringing this conversation back to the community, updating them with the progress, and making sure we just frame the conversation the right way that you know we don't. We've got a lot of considerations, and we don't want to jump into this too quickly. But that's not to say we don't want to be proactive in taking some action. Um, there's a delicate walk there, and I, I, but I do think going back and bringing people along will be will be a good move. Um, that's that's my two cents. So, and thank you to this uh, committee for the work on this. And member Sandstead. Thank you. Um, the effort put in really shows in this presentation and the, all of the information you've collected. And so I really appreciate that. Um, we as a board, um, there's two ways to look at the budget. And in my opinion, you can either look at what we've got and figure out how we're going to tweak it moving forward and just sort of keep going as we're going. Or we can say, here's what we're prioritizing. And these are the things that are important to us. And we're going to make our budget work around um, what we want to do as a district. And so um, I think it's important for us as a board to speak loudly on that and to um, to convey that you know when we have um, ways to improve the district that the community has bought into um, and that we've gone through a um, thorough process to vet things like this, major changes, um, that then the board figures out a way to make this work for us. So I'm not saying we're doing it, but I'm saying that, you know, this is, um, this is something that we as a board, that, that's where we come in and we say, okay, um, we've done the work and this is important and we're going to um, take the next step, at least here. Thanks. I'd like to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for all the work, too. This is uh, fantastic. And I, I have to look at this. This is a lot of data. I agree with Mr. Tuscan that th this has to be brought up somehow with regard to the levy coming up. I mean, money is going to be a part of it, no question. And that, in that sense, I'm not sure whether March is the time, you know, what to do by March, but what the time is, but I think that's crucial, trying to sell it, <clears throat> some, some version of it anyway, with, uh, with regard to the levy. So uh, I think we need to think about all of this as a board and, and come forward. But yeah, you guys have done tremendous work. Um, thank you. La lastly, I just wanted to say, I sometimes I need to be a little more careful with my words. Um, and the one thing I want to make sure is really clear is when I was talking about um, kind of fatigue starting to set in, it's not that people aren't really excited about where we're at and the work that we've done and the potential for the future. I think people are. I just wanted to be considerate of our group and the huge amount of work they've put into this. And I think in closing, I'd, I'd like to say I, I've, I've done a lot of things in my career, but I can't say I've been much more proud than what I've been of this group and the effort that they've put in and how they've worked together with one another through some really difficult conversation to try to do something to change the future for our kids. And it's been a really amazing experience working with them. I'm proud too. And you know what Member Sandstead said is true. I mean, 
we we we're a fairly new we have new members on our board and what what boldness can we go forth and and show them if what what we can do in our district with the support of our community and that we're in charge and we are smart and hard working we've got great support staff and leadership and as a board we are clicking we're we're talking we're valuing we know what the direction is for the most part that we want so we're going to be bold out there yeah we're going to put it in our budget and then say you come and support us you come together because Duluth can be a great place so I just appreciate all the hard work so yeah there's a transition now so um, again thank you so much thank you. thanks Dean too I don't want to leave him out of our thank you and we are now we are jam-packed tonight I don't was uh, was assistant Starseski just just passionate about what we all needed to do I mean this is great stuff and I'm 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 gonna stay smiling and we're gonna be energized right we're we are not gonna show that it is 705 <laughs> but we have Brad and he's with our career tech education program update yes hi there hi <laughs> let me get my stuff ready oh look here. at that solid gold and um, kind of my thoughts for tonight were I gave you a pretty extensive packet um, in stuff, and it was more that information. Yeah. I'm not going to go through that. That's for you to. Uh, That's right. You don't need me to reread something. Um, but it is something with um, February being National CTE or Current Tech Ed Month. Um, any of you on social media know that I'm out pretty hard pushing it and promoting it most of the month. <laughs> and so. <laughs> I, I am, <laughs> once we get connected, um, and, and part of it's been that is when I took over this job three and a half years ago, and when I started presenting to the board last year, uh, you couldn't find the presence of what career opportunities were being offered for kids anyways. And, and so it really did become my passion. All I kept hearing about was, oh, the STC, uh, if we just had the STC. And, and so through my work was our staff are doing great work, our kids are having good experiences, and was getting more of that out there. Um, and so with CT Month, I really definitely buy into a lot of that and getting it going, and I thought, that, you know, it's a good time to come to the Ed Committee and just give you a status update of what's going on um, and some of our issues and some of our concerns, but overall what the program's doing. So the packet for sure will lead you through that. Um, I will pass around because I started talking about all the options. And I, I Vietz, Vietz, yep, like feet with a V. Uh, years of teaching elementary, sorry. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that don't know, I've taught everything and in between, everything in between. So, um, and so with this is looking at. Let me pull up my stuff here. Uh, to let you know kind of just the status of the program, I, I pulled up the school website as long as I had the Chromebook up was one, two, of letting you know it's a resource. Um, I constantly have to tell people that, yeah, we do actually have programs and we have things that people can find. And so it's, it's pretty accessible is you click any of the links and you will find it down where it says ISD 709 Kroon Tech Ed. And for you, that's your chance to do research if you really want to get more into the day-to-day -day of what the kids are doing and what the classes are doing because it doesn't show up in a registration guide and it doesn't show up um, walking through the halls because they're hidden in corners or doors are closed um, and you don't get to see it. And so, so I just wanted to let you at least see that. Um, the sheet that I've passed around is one that I use a lot with a lot of community groups. One is just listing the, the breadth of what we offer. Um, the fact that we have all six career fields that the state recognizes. Of those, we have 12 clusters, and then we also offer 46 courses. Now, that's actually a cut uh, from the previous years. Um, Dr. Carey has talked about how we've revamped and reworked some of the registration guide. And so we've combined some classes, eliminated some classes that were not being offered due to enrollment um, and stuff like that. So it was little tweaks that cut us down. I think we're about down nine class offerings from where we were last year, somewhere around there. Um, but the, the general status is CTE is doing really well. Uh, enrollments are up um, this year. I decided I'd really focus in the packet. The first thing I put in there was the two-year and four-year college placement um, because that is the one that you start seeing a lot of data points on. And, and the fact that 52% of our kids that take CTE courses end up going to a two-year or a four-year uh, is a good route in, or a good option that I don't think our teachers get enough recognition for. Um, and all that data is in the, 
on the stuff that's in that was attached. It's nothing that I gave you tonight. Um, but from that, it's also lower than the state average. So it's one where we're still not getting kids at the higher rates looking at college, even though they're taking these career classes and getting these exposures. And so that's one of my focuses as I move forward. Um, but I wanted to let you know also that the other good points, if you look at the sheet, um, it was the one on your packet, if you've got the packet open, this one. It's the first two pages of it. It's kind of my little infographic one that I use a lot. And on the back side of that, you will see kind of highlighted enrollment data and, and our MCA results. The biggest thing I try to push to people is the career tech ed programs in Duluth, you tend not to get those kids that would say they're college bound or that are thriving in all their core classes. But if you look at our students, um, you know, we place, you know, we're at 47.79 with our MCA scores in reading. That's down a little bit this year, but we've gone up in the rest. Um, our graduation rate for our students is 88%. Um, and again, these aren't the, the kids that tend to be on a very good graduation path until they hook up with CTE. Um, so we provide those services. We also have 26% um, of our students are what they call non-trad. And that means females looking at construction or welding or skilled trades, um, or males looking at health occupations and some other routes that are traditionally non-traditional. Um, and, and where that number comes in, we're doing pretty well, is because it's designated non-trad if less than 5% of that gender is in that career field. Um, so it's really got to be a very broad <laughs> or a despair, a wide breadth of who's doing that. Um, so we're doing pretty well of getting kids exposed to that. And so um, we do serve a high amount of uh, special service population. Um, we're sitting right now at about uh, 367 out of our total 700 enrollees. So just below 50% um, are either on an IEP or qualify for some special service. Um, so we are serving a, a very unique group. Um, and what I constantly push my staff is you don't have an IEP when you're employed. Um, you've got to get a job. And so it's been a big shift for them to start looking at that going, how do you give kids a, a career option and the skills? Um, but we're sitting at about 1,270 enrolled, and that's not individual headcount because you have kids that take multiple. Um, and so, and again, this is all from the previous year. We're actually higher this year, but we don't have that data until the year's complete. Um, and so with that sheet, um, I, I definitely wanted to just kind of talk about that. Probably one of my concerns is we're doing really well with students of color and protected populations. Um, our, our graduation percentage rate there is way higher than the district average. Um, and so is the achievement gap is, is lessened in those areas for kids that take two or more. But the part that doesn't show up is we're not getting those kids to take those classes. Uh, the percentages are high, but the enrollment numbers are low. And, and I didn't want to bombard you with all those data points, but um, it doesn't match the district percentage of 20-some percent students of color. Uh, we're well below that, but the kids that are doing it are having great success. Um, and yet they're really high in the college placement as well. But there's a disconnect where we're not getting them to actually look at these classes in high school. Um, so that's another one that we're going to look at CTE-wise. Um, as far as the general programs, besides the amount of what they are, uh, the biggest change this year was the district committing additional FTE to the programs. Uh, the previous years, it wasn't based on enrollment. It was kind of a, a battle and a chess game on whether you provide that course or not, because you have to understand the CT classes have to stay smaller. Uh, the one I use is you don't want 35 kids on a roof building a house. Um, but that's the, the, the issue the district faces is how do you justify a class with less than 20 kids when you have other classes with 40 kids. And for me, it's serving that population and, and getting those graduation rates is my priority, so I think those help. Um, but from that, we've got, I'd say this year we're probably going to be up 100 or 200 more enrollees just by the classes that we've offered. Um, the big thing in the news, or the big thing for us, is every five years you have to do a program approval. Uh, that ends up being about 200 and some pages of spreadsheet fun that I got to have. Uh, <laughs> but we we got those all done for the next five years, so all of our programs are set and eligible for Perkins money, which is additional money that comes in that saves the district money, um, and then also the levy. Um, the fact that we can levy those options. And uh, you'll hear that from Mr. Hassler and the rest on choosing whether we do that. Uh, if you're not aware, any CTE program, the state allows us to levy 35% uh, of salary, supply cost, transportation, some of those unique things to career and tech ed to offset 
whether it's the class size, whether it's, you know, we, we can choose what that 35% would be uh, beneficial for, but it's one of those things to help. Um, and so, so right now we currently have every single program that is career and tech ed or vocational is approved and allows us that arm to, to levy a little more. Um, the, the biggest news and highlights, if I could show videos, would probably be seeing um, the new uh, EMR, first aid basic life support class. It's not your uh, become a lifeguard <laughs> first aid. Uh, our students there actually uh, can get their 60 hour EMR certification and then get their pre-hospital uh, basic life support and first aid. Uh, we piloted it this year and uh, the kids are loving it. It's, it's going really well and the, the teacher's doing really well. Uh, she, she tells me she feels like a first year teacher again because she doesn't feel like she knows any of it. Uh, and so she, she's doing good work there. Uh, child development is kind of our first attempt at bringing it back to looking at educational careers. Um, and we're sitting at about 60 kids taking that this year, which is another good amount of kids actually looking at an educational pathway. Um, we're not sure how that ties to pathways to teaching yet or how it would intertwine, but um, seeing kids looking at that route is a good route. Um, the big other big one at the Denfell, the West End, was with Fab Lab Complete. Uh, we, we were able to pilot a manufacturing course, uh, not based on enrollment, but letting kids for the first time see the difference between an engineering course and a manufacturing course, which really the biggest difference is manufacturing you build first and kind of worry about design, and in the engineering you're designing first and you're not so much about the build. And so it was, it was good to see that, and we're hoping enrollment goes up for that next year. The biggest thing, I think, um, and it came up again last spring, was the equity part. And uh, this year, with the cleanup of the registration guide, there is not a single course offering in Duluth that isn't offered to both kids at or both sites as an option. Um, and that's been a big change in the career and tech ed route because it was hard to get logistically things done. Um, but we've either tweaked how we offer them or which ways they go because uh, the travel doesn't work well for most of the programs. Uh, kids just choose not to leave their sites. And so the, 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 the one that does is automotive. Kid, kids travel for automotive, but the rest of them they're not. And so we've made some curricular changes to try to get kids offered the, at least the same basic skills, even if the programs are a little different. Um, general highlights, if you look at that sheet I gave you, and I really wanted to make sure we plugged the community and the folks that tied in to us. Um, the biggest one I was out there today was construction. Uh, it's been a hidden one where they've been around the city for years and no one has seen them lately. Um, but we've partnered with LSC this year to get them building houses again as opposed to sheds and decks, and it is amazing to watch the kids. It's a, it's a whole different level, and I'd recommend you go out and visit that site to see what they're up to. Um, the other one, um, it's up off of Haynes Road. Um, if you head up, and it's just past Morris Thomas. And uh, that's been going well, I'm, but it'll be intriguing there to see, and I put in that report of how do you expand it. Um, I know Dr. Carey and I have battled for years of, you know, if it's only going to be 30, 40 kids all day, <laughs> and you've got teachers with 200 kids all day, that, that's a, a different justification when, when you're looking at financial issues. So um, the other big one you've seen earlier in the fall was the outdoor classroom, um, that the egg program and the natural resources were the only amphitheater that Duluth has a lot of hills, and so we naturally had an amphitheater in our school forest, um, and so that's been completed. Um, automotive, the big one there is, uh, it's one of the only, I think there's only eight nationally certified programs in the state of Minnesota, and Duluth has one, and we had to go through that recertification last spring, um, which is basically show and tell of what you've done and all your record keeping. So we completed that last spring. We've transitioned to a new instructor, which is really hard when you think about trying to find an automotive person to want to give up their career, um, and he's phenomenal. <laughs> he's, he's, a, you know, I mean, he's a natural born teacher, um, and, and the kids, have, the program is thriving under him, and so definitely stop by and say hi to him, because it's, it's a change becoming a teacher <laughs> from your current, from doing something that uh, along that line. Um, and I mentioned already the engineering program. We've made the major changes at both sites. Uh, the biggest thing there has been um, we've offered after-school girls welding for two years now. Uh, last year it was all Denfeld kids. This year it happened to be all East kids that wanted to do it. And so we've had four females that traveled over to Denfeld um, after school for eight weeks and they just finished making garden signs for the East Gardens. Uh, so they plasma cut it all and all tech has been phenomenal helping them. So they actually brought it to the paint booth and painted them all. Uh, so they got to experience that. Um, 
but that one's also been just on the sheet you can see the growth of clubs the growth of growth of skills assessments uh, the, the programs doing really well um, the last thing I want to do before we get going and get you out of here is uh, recognizing for sure those industry partners um, I know we had the apex crew here uh, earlier that donated all the cold weather gear and so I wanted to make sure on the second page of the document that I listed um, the yellow one lists for sure the again it's not the printed out one for you guys it's the online one <laughs> is you know North Star Ford you know they didn't get the press and they they donated a whole vehicle to us for the automotive program no charge and they also donated about three thousand dollars worth of equipment uh, just because they were at our advisory meeting and said hey we'll take care of that um, they're also looking at potentially donating hoists if we can find a way to get them installed um, because the industry needs the workforce um, North Shore Estates provides their entire facility for CNA this spring where our kids have an actual clinical site that they get to go to um, and then being willing to work with our kids and mentor our kids and then I mentioned Alltech because they they provided they paid their female welder her normal salary to come teach our kids how to weld after school instead of me trying to find donations and stuff like that um, they've provided materials they've given kids right now we're trying to set up an internship uh, we've got an 18 year old female student at East that wants to work at Alltech after graduation and so they're working with me right now just to even get her on site and explore the whole facility beforehand um, and then LSC Lake Superior College has been huge. Uh, they, they take our teachers whenever. They're providing equipment. They're providing software. Uh, they, they have trained Kim Olson on this EMR and basically let her take every class that they could offer for free just so she could get caught up and know some of that stuff. So the partnerships with Duluth are huge, but it's one where it doesn't matter how many times I tweet, <laughs> it can't get out enough. Um, and then on the bottom, I just listed literally all the industries that serve on our committees and give time just like you folks do um, to come in and talk about our kids and talk about what they're doing because, again, we, we get hidden in the corner sometimes. So uh, Korean Tech Ed overall is doing really well. Um, I know budgets are always tight, but I think it's uh, something I would recommend giving any of you a tour any time to come see um, because we took the counselors out before registration just so they could see the labs in action. Um, it, it's a different setting to see what those kids do and watching them because if you followed them throughout the day, they're struggling most of the day in other aspects, and they hit that classroom, and it's magic for them. So um, the last big one, and Bill, was if he was going to be here, I would let him keep talking about it. We are exploring regional pathways and regional career academy-style things. Um, our Perkins board pulled together all the regional superintendents last week and started looking at going up regionally, how could this area get a model that lets kids have access to programs? Um, Duluth is the only automotive program. We have the only graphic design program. We have the only CNA program. But how do Proctor, Hermantown, ESCO kids get access to that? How do we get our kids access to some of their programs if they have a better one than we have? Um, so we've begun the preliminary exploration of what that would look like, what it would cost. Um, because you see other areas of the state, everyone else is looking at it as well. Whether it's Alexandria, whether it's Rochester, there's regions trying to find ways of how do you get kids to explore their post-secondary plans. And so this isn't even career and tech ed based. You know, we've talked about how do we make PSEO more cost neutral <laughs> for a district? How do we, you know, get those offerings to kids? So we're at least getting a group together to, to start discussing that because I think the first school that figures that out <laughs> or the first regional area that figures it out is gonna be in a good spot to give kids a better option. So um, I won't waste any more of your time, um, but if you have any questions or thoughts or, things that you'd like to ask me either now's your chance because we'll be having kids show up at your meeting with all sorts of fun toys to put you through so <laughs> member Gorham. uh number one you didn't waste your time at all thank all right, you thanks. for being here yeah. and uh thank you for all you do to promote the programs and, and the work that you do it's, it's huge it's great uh, very very important work um one of the things we see with i work in public health mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that affects quality of life, life expectancy, is, is your income. And, and really the roots of it are in your education. And so I think the fact that uh, we're providing students these opportunities to explore a wide variety of careers is, uh, is just tremendous. So uh, thank you so much for your work. Um, well, thank you. And I guess my last story would be based on kind of what you said is, and I use this one to everyone to 
get the se get rid of the separation between Korean tech ed and the core academic areas. You still hear that sometimes of it becomes tracking or kids not good enough for college or those. Um, we had a graduate last year who ended up going out to Idaho State to become a mechanical engineer, and uh, she went there and one of the requirements is to try to find a club to get on a building club or a design club or a challenge club and during their orientation they were asking you know what's a, what's a hidden talent you got and she goes oh when I was in Duluth I learned how to weld she said I, I, I took some welding classes well here was a four-year college kid with four-year college kids all around her and instantly she became the number one commodity because none of them had that skill because they were college bound and so to me trying to blend those lines of getting kids to realize that if you're going to go pre-med why aren't you taking medical terminology and allied health you know and getting some of those connections across because the skills are broad whether it's the class or not so that's the other one we're trying to fix or just want to one last comment I don't think Brad sometimes blows his own horn loud enough, um, and so I'm going to do it for him, which is that he does an amazing job of leveraging connections in our community, both in terms of getting us support for resources, and that's material resources, human resources, like he talked about with companies donating their staff's time, and then with just community support in terms of people in our industries understanding how our schools can work collaboratively with them and then and then being willing to engage with us to move things forward. He's done an amazing job in the last few years that he's been here helping us improve those things as an organization. And I just think somebody needs to say it publicly. So That's all I got. So we're just going to thank you again. And then I want, you know, the, the thing that keeps going over to, and I'm sure, is that we don't, he, he can tweet about CTE, because I get all of them, too, as we all do, I think, and they're just engaging. And we just need more more publicity about the great things that go on. We, In our budget, we don't have a whole lot of money set aside for promoting our school district, and I think that hurts us. And so when I was um, when I visit all these schools, like this past weekend, the school had like banners of of their kids in all their different activities or their clubs or or their classes. And I just think that you know within our schools, if we had highlighting our kids with with their instructor in the first aid or mm -hmm. in the child development or in welding or in our automotive just construction big banners throughout the school celebrating all of our kids and, and that's with the physics book as well yeah. and giving a speech but and that's one if you go through the documents that I attached um, you'll see one thing I put on there was marketing and, yeah. and it is one of you know we, we do things the biggest thing is trying to get those kids to connect to the school beyond their career class um, right. and there are other schools that do great work with that um, because it is that connection and so yeah a marketing budget or getting something you know because right now it's big steel and borrow and you know mm -hmm. the CTE board isn't done because I'm I'm letting a student do it I'm waiting one whole year for a student because I think our graphic design students right. will do just as well as paying someone to do it um, so I think you're right is getting that out there because I think Duluth is doing a lot of things phenomenally well and uh, there's data to support it and and we just need to get it out there more um, beyond just CTE and so it's something to look at. I'm picturing a meet and greet with the women um, school board members at the welding program as a way to promote that. <laughs> well the, the female welders are already uh, pumped to come next at the 27th meeting so they'll be here uh, they, they might even pull out the virtual welder and make you uh, have to try it yourself so uh, it was good because yeah the, the principals came the first night just to see it. and it's one of those things once people try it it's something we all say oh let's learn how to do and and, and that's me daily I watch you know today at the construction site watching the kids you know it, one it was warm so they didn't look like they were freezing to death but uh watching them you know just no skills that i could never even fathom <laughs> you know my my history is cooking so you walk me into a restaurant i'm okay but uh you take me to these other classes and see what the automotive instructors can get our kids to do and what the graphics teacher um and the chef you know both chefs are doing phenomenal work with the kids and getting them jobs and that's ultimately what we want so just one closing comment, I hate to make it longer, but maybe we can do this on a more individual basis as well, or maybe you can do some kind of an email, not immediately to us, but on our on our um, campaign trails and just in the election process, there was just a lot of heated arguments around the offerings that we have in our district and how East 
has more than the west side and i was i was looking at before i came to all of your data that you have with the numbers and and there's a lot of classes listed that are we putting those in our catalog but we just don't get um, students to elect that so right now with the changes we made last year um, there were major changes where the biggest east-west divide prior to the fab lab being built was that there wasn't any access to a skilled trades um, in that field so the CAD classes the engineering classes the manufacturing courses because Denfeld didn't have a lab um, and so Dr. Carey and I and the instructor we all worked once that was done for this year's registration guide where now every class is the same but there'll still be the enrollment issues of just the, the size. You know, East has 1,600 or 1,500 kids. They can fill a section faster than Denfeld. And so the instructor and I have worked, too, of how can we offer those classes even if they're combined without killing him. And have, you know, he, right now he teaches two or three classes in every hour because he switched to an online blended course. But it's still hard when you get one kid that wants architecture. And how do you, how do you offer that to them? And so okay. we've had to get inventive. The important thing to note, and I've said this in previous years, but the course guide that goes out to our students at both of our high schools is absolutely mm -hmm. identical. Yes. It's, it's, it's a difference in um, both the number of students in the building, right? East is significantly larger. Um, and then the course taking patterns of students within the buildings that leads to there being fewer or more sections of a certain course in one building or the other. And what happens then is if you have a building that has a lower number of sections of a specific course, it can make it more difficult for a student to be able to try to get all of the classes they want fit within their schedule because of some of the scheduling conflicts that arise. It's an absolutely normal phenomenon across every district across the country. I mean, I don't think that's probably too broad of a statement. <laughs> every, every major system I've been a part of, you saw some of those variations from site to site. The and question is how comfortable are we with those variations of what do we want to do to address those when yeah. they exist. And one that I don't think there's many other in the district except for my CT teachers is also the travel. You know, so a lot of the, the difference too is like our CNA and health occupations class, there's only one of her. And so if you wanted to take it first hour or first block and you're at East, you can't because she's physically at Denfeld at that point. So this gets some of those shifts too of when you share staff and having to maximize their resource that they might love it and want it but if the teacher's not physically in the building because they have to be at the other site you just can't help but work that around sometimes and and there's waiting lists and to me I, I firmly believe as a career and tech ed coordinator there's a certain good thing about waiting lists because it kind of builds some of that need and that desire so it's you know I'm not one either that I think we should always chase enrollment. Um, because in my world, let's say you added a whole new CNA program next year because enrollment said, and then the next year it drops. Well, it's not like that teacher now can go do something else. That teacher's going to lose their job because they can't bounce into a different area. They can't go into something. So you've really got to shepherd those career classes and figure out what your threshold is versus offering versus capacity um, because there are the blips of enrollment and, and how do you handle that. And that's where the principals and I have to sit and work through <laughs> some of those things because it's hard at that point of you, you could do a full-time teacher at one, but who's going to take a point two at another site? You know, you would, you would never find a qualified candidate that would want that. And so you got to try to balance those out to make sure that we don't lose out either way. So, but it's, it's no easy answer. As we discovered, I think, as we tried to talk with our community this past summer, and my, so my, my challenge is just that even as board members, because um, I don't, you know, one of the things I wonder about is if we will get the same conversations continuing now that the election cycle is over, do people just stop, you know, coming to us and, and telling us? Because this, you know, again, I, I really had a, a lot of conversations in September, especially it seemed, about the offerings and about the CE, CTE offerings and, you know, and, and a lot about the, you know, it's offered, but if there's not enrollment at, at one of the sites, then it can't be offered. And I understand that, but our community does not. They see it as an equity issue, and so that got all messy. And so you're going to help us wade through that. But again, I don't know if the, if the um, conversations that we all got during our time of going out in our community stay the same, or do they just disappear? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. 
But some of you have to run again in a while, so we'll figure it out. So thank you. We're going to move on to our just um, other little policy things that we have to do. And without Amy here, I've, I'm going to I'm kind of alone. Yeah, go for it. Because I know you can move us quicker. Yep. Uh, well, I don't know about quicker, but Amy did ask if I'd help. So, um, if you take a look under our informational items, we have grant applications under letter C. Um, the first is a Rotary Club 25 grant application. Um, Kelly Mulliner, who's one of our teachers at Lester Park, um, has submitted a grant in the amount of $1,500 that would be used for hammocks um, to be used by students in the school forest um, for reading and to extend our learning environment. Um, then if we go to our action items, you'll see that for this month um, we have our policies section. Um, it's, uh, again, deletion of 6098, which is the credit for learning. This is our second reading. Um, and then that would be replaced by the new policy, which is 6020. Um, again, credit for learning, which is part of our um, revamping and getting in line with our MSBA model policies. You can see that there is a um, resolution for an acceptance of a grant award. Um, those grant awards happen to be, um, one is, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but the Patchell, thank you. You saved me before I even had to. Um, the Patchell Foundation, um, which you can see is for um, theater written by Matthew Percy, and that the purpose of that is to provide a projector um, at Denfeld, I believe if I'm accurate here. And then the other is... Well, actually, sorry, it's just the one resolution. And then there's supporting documentation there. Then we go to our normal kind of monthly diploma requests, and that wraps up the agenda for this month.